Right, day four of these nine. Uh, we are now switching uh, switching focus from Bell Heritage to uh, archaeological sites uh, for the day or part of the day. Uh, nothing, nothing of any moment to the mountains on. So, with you, Mr. Madan. So, so the um, submission. Um, just a little So, um, just in terms of some scene setting, so the operative district plan currently lists um, 30 archaeological sites in the state. Um, and there are, um, they're basically categorizing group one, two, group two. Um, and due to the significance of group one sites, is something to develop control as well as the group two sites. So as part of the country group of Dixie sitting engaged to help you with the paper. So our site is the online base that contains information about the site is from New Zealand, the WS Um, I've just explained in paragraph 66 that we have done an assessment of um, those sites. Focus does the limitations. I think there's a significant overlap. I don't know the answer to what you put in the sense that there's still going to be a wide and comprehensive. No work program. No. 
but will have an overlap with the capitalist and ensure that the delivery of the inventory of sciences will be with the archaeological sciences um, that I suppose. But at this stage, there's no uh, there's certainty uh, clarity of The work that's being done, the end of the week, and what's done exactly what it feels like. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yes. That's nice to be. Um, but it was internally <clears throat> when PC9 came to be notified it was going to be worked up and the documentation. It was determined that the work in relation to sites of sites and Maori was not really not sufficiently really and robust to be part of the notified plan change. So it was decided that it should be put to one side and aimed further with basically. Yeah. 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 Yes, I think that's right. And uh, again, it's quite a matter of people talking about the table because in the neighborhood, yeah, that's what I'm saying. But but even the encountering where I'm still not sure. I just know, just know, because I don't think the the schedules are the same. Those questions around the time of the um, at 60, paragraph 68, I've just uh, been in the invite to get started with um, and talk about what the uh, the notified version of the Zen Line was doing. I think 56 at that time was in the sites, schedules, making some transfers between the real sites um, and making some things in correction. Um, in paragraph 62, I was really good at the scope of I made it significantly because of the limited scope of the um, 
um, archaeological uh, site is an archaeological cultural site to which are all seeding and shooting and goes in the which are not related to an archaeological site, but an app site, I mean, like this, it's more of so you will get some archaeological sites within, you know, tech listed in, you know, but it might not be an app site. So you can see that I have to revise those and it will be not an app site. Um, similarly, um, archaeological and cultural sites with a little bit of shooting and going in deep and not the main thing to pay for it. It's a bit outside the scope. It's However, existing sites where the design like deliberately make changes to the map and extent of the archaeological sites are within the scope of the design and the addition of new archaeological and cultural sites will not be included on the art sites are also outside the scope of this time. But there are some suggestions to say we've well, got something else we can add. The point is that we can come in there. PC9 was not tuned into the area of the main change, which would be some insight if we still like hey, what was reported in those sites? So I think that may be the substance of the same. We've got a site included on the map. It's understood. Within Skype, there's the ability to consider the Um, and I think that's simply enough to start. But paragraph 75, I wish it was um, There is there are there is an element of the fact change that I have yet to be Would that, would that allow us to, to, to say whether we actually ask the fundamental question of the just to take a view? 
um, yeah, potentially more on that point. Uh, that should be in a different extension. Yeah, I think that, that that issue is very much alive. It's a question of whether that that scope would extend into asking the fundamental question of should the trip around the flag. Do we, do we have any, have any I'm not sure that we do. I don't recall the But there's certainly, I think, in terms of the framing, my, my suggestion would be in terms of the framing, yes, no. I think that there is, um, there is no question that the management regime is changing. There are changes in terms of the planning framework on how these these items are, are with our managed. Um, so there's, there's no question to change the management regime. Um, but I think that the, the, the questions of what's listed and what's not, I think, are defined by the way that the plan change was framed up in the first place. And as I say, it had a, it had a narrow focus. Um, it was you know, so contrast to something like HHAs, where HHAs started out as we're doing a comprehensive review of the, the city to determine where are the candidates on HHAs. Um, that's not what the list of record. This did not do a comprehensive review of every single potential outside or so significant to Māori and say, we don't capture it and be allowed a submitter to say you must go. So I think it's as I say that there are a handful of submissions. Um, in terms of the uh, the submissions in paragraph seventy six, I just make a, a brief summary of the key things through in the submission. So um, a, a range of matters. First, there was the methodology used to identify and assess the archaeological sites, including perceived lack of ground truthing and potentially inaccurate uh, significance assessments. There were site-specific changes sought, including removal of sites from the schedule, a small number of submitters seeking additions to the schedule. Um, there were concerns raised about the accuracy of the spatial extent and the mapping of the archaeological sites. Um, general concerns raised about the burdens being placed on landowners um, and the loss of archaeological development due to uh, existing on site development. Um, expressions of support for the PC9 planning framework and changes uh, being sought to make the framework, um, including um, things like improved technology, reduced constraints. Um, Consenting obligations, uh, particularly on these people's abilities, and the provision of customary activities and the uniform restricted discretion and status of group one or two sides. So that was the sort of the sweep of the submission themes. Was there also, um, you might be confusing this group with one of the other topics, um, submissions aimed at the duplication of the regime? With, with like, Yes, there is, that, that, that is a thing, yeah. and again, that's a matter that um, this is where, uh, Ryan can speak to you on the new business in the next few minutes in terms of the differences between what is, what is being um, said. Um, so, just dealing with the response to some of so. Mr. Um, uh, Kennedy um, conducted the site visits of the archaeological sites in the previous report as part of the preparation of the ground of those sites. The new facilities seem to be in scope, taking into account the level of ground truth on a new archaeological report since September 2021. That might be a thing to. Um, Raised around which is the date that we use both ways to see and review the planning maps to confirm with the map of the scene that we reflect in the site of the scene. So, the so as a result of that further work, So 
which addresses a range of issues um, which I've, I've set out in paragraph 79 ranging from minor wording changes um, amendments uh, to uh, ensure that AEs um, properly address cultural and spiritual values and the relationship of one of them with sites from an information only status to a category of sites which do require a question which I'll put so the witnesses can hear it. <clears throat> 21 sites are being put in group two and being put into group the CA is what they've gone. Mm. <clears throat> That's an group two is an information. leads to evidence of, of an archaeological uh, nature. Well, networks, which has provided painting and archaeological evidence to support. Well, see. Works of existing established network utilities um, as a permitted activity. Um, Mr. Cable considers that it can't be guaranteed that if it was a bit of activity that um, excavations for such work would be confined within the extent of the previous areas of cut associated with the installation of the existing networks. And Mr. Ryan considers that the proposed rule is impractical and unenforceable. Um, and accordingly, both uh, recommend that the relief be sought by well being intended. So, I think the key, the key message in terms of the well is because I think, on the one hand, there's a there's an understanding and a, and, a, and a certain degree of sympathy for what we're looking for here. It's the ability for them to just get in and get get on with dealing with their their network um, and excavations and things that, that they consider necessary, and they want to be do, able to do it as a permitted activity. They don't want to be snagged by resource consent. Um, but the concern that uh, Mr. Taylor and Mr. Ryan have is that. How can, how can we be sure that in, in doing that, we're not going to encroach on an archaeological site um, and do damage, irreparable damage? So 
the preference is you know, just by snagging well networks with a consenting regime, which is a need to speak with time consuming costly and, and um, yeah, frustrating in terms of their day to day business. Um, the, the, the planning response is to say the issues are significant enough, and we are talking about heart food, section six issues here. But um, the, the risks associated with leaving into a group that could break them. Um, and so um, it needs some kind of uh, way to separate out. Um, I'm sort of thinking um, you know, if you've got a, a pipe or something that's in the ground and you're seeking to maintain and replace a little part of it, you know, with the mm. tiny thing versus pulling out the whole thing and then replacing it. Mm. I mean, there's a, a graduation of, I guess, of risk or of scale there, there and is. wondering whether or not um, any consideration has been given to kind of distinguishing those types of activities. Wholesale replacement might have, you know, a, um, a magnitude of effects significantly greater than just going in and tinkering mm. with a few little bits and pieces. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think this is a this is a challenging question because mm -hmm. it's, it, it, and there's two sides to this point. On the one hand, you can say, well, the best way to deal with this is permitted activity status, um, which is what Well would say. But then again, you know, how do you determine when the consent is triggered? Like, what's the mm -hmm. what's the what's the nature of the excavation or the work that you just described that mm -hmm. takes it from permitted? You know, you know, you're out there on the ground, and you know, you're, you're digging or you're dealing with this particular asset. And you, you're a permitted activity. At what point are you not? You know, what, at what point does the characteristics of the of the work take you into? Oh, you need to consent. It's quite a challenging, practical question. But if you, I mean, if you're remaining within the existing footprint, mm. surely that is the log. Well, that that may be the answer. Uh, well, would say it, it is the answer, and I think this is the this is the this is the concern. How do you how do you control it? Is there a, are there a set of protocols or guidelines or um, you know, commitments that we can be assured are adhered to, and you stay within the lines? This this is the practical problem. Now, it may be that. Um, you determine that well that yes that is a practical problem but I don't want to resolve the problem by just throwing them into a consenting regime um because that has efficiency issues and, and so on and so forth. So yeah it's not an this is not an easy one um but certainly the the witnesses for the city say you know, in terms of the part two section six significance of the identified site um they would say the, 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 the better resource management response is get yeah, consent. Let's be, you know, let's be cautious. So there's, there is a, 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 I guess you would say, a cautionary approach being built into and being recommended. Well, the works, I'm sure, will tell you that it's balanced and right and you need to be you know, more permissive. Mm -hmm. um, if that's a, uh, that's a good question. I've got a slightly different question. I'm off here. I've got the same question to um, Ms. Brown, but um, would it be your understanding that given that these are arch site sites, that, that they have to get out here which New Zealand authority? Yes, yes. yes I think that's, that's right. Um, and again, I think well, we'll say so that should be enough. And the point is, well, um, is the authority from uh, is the hearing authority actually doing the same thing as what a controlled activity were? I think you'll hear from resource users to say we shouldn't have to have the things happen. Um, the other um, uh, submitter who has produced uh, some, some expert archaeological evidence is Cordeline, which is a, a developer and landowner in the Peacock. Um, and this is a this is a sort of scope issue. So the, the, the key issue here is that the 
cited and dealt with through PC5. Um, and there is, I think, one minor wording change to bring it into consistency with what PC9 is, is doing, which is, I think, changing the, the, the legal description and the general description of the site and replacing borrowed pit with Māori push culture. And I just had a question on that, which possibly for your witnesses rather than you, but I'll just flag mm -hmm. it now. Um, is that a significant change? Is, is Māori horticulture a, a broader category than a borrow pit? And does it have any difference in terms of how the rules, uh, how the site's treated? Uh, again, that, that, that's a question I think we need to put to the witnesses. I don't understand it to change um, the status of the, um, the site in any material way in terms of the, the rule framework. Um, uh, but again, let, let's let's share that with the, with the witnesses. You can do a deep dive on that one. I mean, at first blush, it is a different that too. Still, still, there's a conversation. So I think there's a, there's a there's a bit of an issue mm -hmm. again about whether the the change that's been made for that particular uh, site. Um, is sufficient it's sufficient for lay a foundation for some slightly broader relief that borderline is seeking in the notwithstanding the fact that the drops is not in scope. And then the final um, party that's provided expert evidence is um, here at British New Zealand. Um, and um, in response to issues raised by um, Mr. Kelly and Ms. Starrett, Mr. Ryan has recommended amendments to two rules and an advice note. Um, but there is various other relief that, again, we would say is outside of the scope for the reasons that I described earlier, um, including the identification of unreported sites. Um, so, coming to the hearing presentations, in terms of what we understand of, of the submitters that are presenting evidence, there's only a small number that we wish to present. Um, and so we didn't have a lot of pre-circulated evidence um, because so much of it is not expert. Um, but our understanding of what's to come um, is that there is, um, firstly, um, Manga uh, Waita Piripiri Kaitiaki, which is Mr. King, um, who's raising concerns that um, we consider that they're probably outside of the scope of PC9, again, for the reasons that have explored. And a lot of those concerns relate to consultation and engagement processes um, in the past destruction of archaeological sites and related processes under the HNZ um, PTA and, and restoration projects. So, um, again, without the pre-circulation of the evidence, I'm not entirely sure what's to be presented, but I think the general uh, response from Hamilton City, this is probably um, likely to be a lot of um, very useful and, and important material um, that the uh, wishes to, to record, but exactly what it leads to in terms of scope and relief in this plan change, I think it's probably going to be quite limited, um, and probably it has its more natural place um, in terms of engagement and, and need in that further work stream that we've talked about in terms of sites of significance. Um, but again, without seeing exactly what's to be presented, um, part of it. there's also thought, which of course is the consultation um, vehicle that draws together the, um, the various hapu, um within um, Hamilton City. Um, and thought seeks that the city work with it to develop maps showing the location and extent of sites of significance to Mana Whenua based on Māori values and not European archaeological values. And for this map to be included in the next district plan review revision. So again, it, it sort of has a similar theme in that there's probably a, a lot of really um, very valuable and rich material um, to be provided um, through the consultation with Thorpe. Um, but again, it probably falls more naturally towards good stream in relation to sizes. So we will see what that presentation holds. Um, and then finally, there's, um, oh, sorry, finally, there's uh, Housley, Susan and Shane Housley, uh, who seek to amend uh, Rule 19.4.2b to clarify that any measures recommended by Mount Benua to avoid remedy or mitigate adverse relate directly to the proposal and the significance of any potential 
fit for Mr. Ryan has proposed amendments to the rule to clarify uh, requirements in terms of nation measures. Uh, and then there's the Waikato Heritage Group um, seeking to have 20th century sites, such as industrial sites, scheduled with the plan as archaeological sites. And the policy uh, included the plan for management of those sites. And uh, the city would say that that request is beyond the scope of BC9. And in addition, the observation is made by the experts that 20th century sites are not archaeological sites, and it's declared so. Um, and accordingly, Mr. Ryan has recommended that that. Just on that, and I know that's um, an, an addition rather than a primary response, but do we know if there's any section 43 declaration for the fixed bar site? The question is probably for the witness. Yes, I don't know the answer to that. Um, maybe that what can I hear which group can also help with that if they produce. Um, so that's that's really the the, the submissions. I mean, I, I think from a legal perspective, probably the you, you've seen the key legal thing is really a scope one mm -hmm. on this topic. Um, there's not um, uh, it doesn't feel um, that there is quite such a hot contest on this topic in relation to the methodology and the identification of sites. There's the sun, but it certainly doesn't have the same um, level of contest that. So I don't think that's really a central, doesn't feel to me as a, as a central issue. I think there's concerns over you know, the, the and issues around the management of and uh, um, and then probably a, a sort of a general theme uh, of um, wanting to potentially take it further than what BC9 actually does. Um, so, um, yeah, I, th I think for me, the that they certainly don't present quite the same level of, of legal issues. That it's just a matter of I think hearing the evidence, the expert evidence, is capable, um, and I in terms of the. Yeah, I think it's all well, I'm just in case. That's not the case. I want to read those. Yes. Welcome again. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, no questions. Yeah. And just to confirm, we've read both statements that we've provided. Very good. I'll provide a, a short. Summary from my first statements. Yeah, <clears throat> the, the summary from yeah. the statements. And free to jump in on the on the dialogue that we've just had as well. Oh, that's a good answer for you. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's rushed my slide. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so I'll, I'll just uh, run it through. Sorry, I've given that information on my laptop. Just to read it. Yeah, get it to a bigger deal. My full name is Nicholas McBee Cable. Uh, I'm a consultant archaeologist based in Christchurch, previously employed as a consultant archaeologist by WSP, former one of the office international consultants. I was employed from Lithiums in 2004 to 2021. Uh, I was based in the Hamilton office of WSP from 2005 to 2011. Were you involved in the WSP background work for this? Yes, there was one. Yeah, um, and I also continue to be involved in that as well as other projects in the Hamilton Office. I think it's been one. So, uh, I've got the qualifications experience to get in my rooms. So I'll go through those. Uh, in answer to your question, I, I provided the archaeology site and the tree. That is within the appendix to the team team. And I was also involved in uh, several initial fully with uh, the Nanaki Office in 2021. Uh, in order to review the, the content of the archaeology site information, like uh, mandate for the sector. Um, 
Uh, I was then next engaged by Hamilton City Council in late July of this year uh, to prepare evidence in response to the submissions. I responded to the matters raised in the submissions of further submission statement of evidence. Uh, very briefly, um, the submissions and further submissions raised methodology issues with the archaeological site assessments, used to determine the archaeological and cultural evidence in Pantene China. These issues highlighted a lack of ground truthing and inaccurate spatial mapping as we well report significant assessments. Other matters raised included the removal of sites that were scheduled, which were deemed to have been destroyed by modern development, and, and the inclusion of other archaeology sites which had not yet been recorded in that site. Uh, in response, I undertook to the ground truthing of, uh, of sites that hadn't been visited as part of the archaeology site inventory to ensure that all the site condition information was as up to date as possible. Before you run there, did you visit all of the sites and have, have all of the sites been reported? I wasn't clear from your evidence whether every site that um, is now every um, site included that is through PP9. Within the narrow scope that was defined, uh, with the exception of uh, one site where we couldn't get the permission from uh, the landowner and uh, sites that didn't have an archaeology contents. There were several artifact find spots. Yeah, the find spot is a that's the time it's not there. Mm -hmm. Could be anywhere within a biochemical stretch of the point, uh, as well as there's a part site next to the cemetery that uh, I've, I've, I've looked through it and have about the five and a half past one so it's not anything I can really look for. Uh, to all intents and purposes, the other side has been visited, either as part of the um, 19 or the so I just, uh, just, just to be clear, in terms of the, the extent, have you modified the ice sites or have you just adopted the ice sites? Oh no, I've, we've, I've modified the ice sites yeah, so to sure. match the results of what I saw on the ground. Yeah, as well as to yeah. <clears throat> so has that information gone back to the uh, Heritage Museum? For well, it's going to be Yes, it's all in the process of going back. Just to make sure those two. Really maintain the line on the top line. Oh, yes. And they have to hold the authorities to actually yeah. respond. So, is there a process with HMD mm -hmm. for actually uh, reconfirming, if you like, the suggestion? Mm -hmm. Not with the Heritage Museum, no. With so the, they, just, uh, uh, that's right. The, the art site, by the way, which is maintained by the New Zealand Archaeology Association. Yeah, it's a clear part. Yes, yeah. and that's just the case. It's not one of those sites. I've got uh, editing rights. So. I've been up having them, I've gone to the file people moderator, the shows where they've been approved them. So it's a it's a different process, and I've, I've done half of us, and I'll continue over the next few months to make sure that I the photographs and my sufficient description, and you can't use which I've got. Is that weird? So that in fact, we're replicating downloading the information from our site into the site of entry, and we're uploading new information from the site of entry for the outside. But just, just you have to carry yeah. that, that conversation on the so the relationship between the <clears throat> between the art site and the Heritage Museum is what? No, no relationship at all? Oh, no, well, the Heritage New Zealand or the Act acknowledges art site as a, 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 a the national database of recorded back in the sites and there was anything else. Yeah, but the association maintains and holds it and the employer of art. Correct. No. Or additional rights to other than yeah, the one. Yeah, approval right per se. Yeah, they grant the authorities, but it's up to the applicants and the archaeologists to identify the archaeology sites to buy them yeah. to satisfy your requirements. And there's no there's no reference panel for archaeologists with that can then consider when you make a recommendation. Oh, no, there's, 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 there's a file to keep the model. Right. Well, and, and, and she reviews information and will accept it all the interim yeah. period and then they get to the top head sites for the day. And mm -hmm. so in the terms of site that we're talking about, that is yet to go through that project or will it, it's a part. It's it's part of the progress. Yeah. <clears throat> I guess why what, what, what I'm testing is whether in actual fact you're the final arbiter on on the on the extents and so on, as far as we're concerned, we yeah. see now. Other body that we use in references. In regard to PC9, I'm part of the I'm sure that was there. Um, and from the digital side, so from the outside, I don't know what we're buying, we're going to the time.
what the timing be? I mean, we don't know when we'll, we'll complete our process. But... Oh, right. Oh, well, I mean, this is maybe one that can be the visible time. Yeah. And and just again, just in terms of practice, is it is it common that that, that sort of recommendation that you would make is actually turned back or or shrunk or expanded or or is it, uh, is it pretty much just a I'm not saying it's a tick box, but it tends to be a tick box. Uh, yeah. and I'll be hypothetical to justify why it changes are the only sites that I've had to find with sites that were recorded from here say all the documentary evidence without without physical evidence. Yeah. Um, I did test that again with a uh, recent version of the country. I mean, this is where source, I don't get what the documentaries in site like that, etc. So it can be, uh, it can be a bit um, arbitrary, but in general, if there's physical evidence, that would be. Right. Good. And so that's the chair on that point. Yes. What's the permanent heading in the USA? Um, any um, law firm's uh, legal submissions on the narrative is basically uh, you were aligning um, sites that were in the NZA arch site, um, so that was reflected in the ODP. <laughs> um, but I think I've now heard you say that as part of that process, contemporaneously, you were also updating. The arch site information. Uh, arch site. Yeah. Okay. So, and so, so is that. No uh, new sites. No new sites. No, I get that. <laughs> but you're not making those sites larger. Yeah. No. No. Well, it, it's refining uh, the information, um, clarifying the boundaries, uh, but in effect, not making the sites any larger. It's just within. No, I'm sorry, I repeat that. No, the outside information is correct. Uh, in terms of the sub it's the ODP that's outset for the outside boundaries. Or even with the uh, ground truth exercise I've done, it's maintaining the view of those sub boundaries as it's having outside. So, one of the things I'm sure about the PC9 making students match the outside students. <laughs> it might be helpful subsequently if you if you provide a couple of examples of where you've actually modified the boundaries and if you've got some sort of overlay or something, they, they just just pick a couple. And just yeah, yeah. I think there's a good example of the overlay that was between PC9 pre review and post review. Pick one is this for the outside boundaries aren't necessarily drawn. Um, although I have provided examples in the evidence of the information. Site boundaries and extra because um, now if you turn to the next year, uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, boundaries have been standard units. Yeah. Uh, this image here is an old era photograph with a dash with the black line around an area. This is the map from our site. So my role has been transferred to that and decided that and we can this now. And obviously it's a custom of boundaries to that's robust enough to be listed in this now. That's the quality of information. Yeah. Yeah. And this, I just want to hone in on this. Yes, that's yes. so really clear because if you look at the legal submission, it said um, the amend, amend the map extent of the sites to match the map extent in the arc site. What oh. we're doing at the same time is you're changing that within the arc site. Is... To, to, to a degree, to a degree, it is a, it is a, there is a symbiotic relationship. Um, so, so but I don't, yeah. So, so it's the to adapting what was in the arc site. It's updating the arc site. You're doing the two together. <laughs> And that has led to some of these changes. Although, in thinking what those changes are, in effect, from the pre notification mapping, I guess, in the post review, uh, the spatial differences, we need a bit of the about that. A minimum, they have changed. The greater differences in what was notified versus the review, for pretty much all those old problems. That would always be a Without picking the hole, you know, so it's going to be a yeah, yeah. <clears throat>
But that hypothesis hits the ground in a serious way on people. Oh, oh absolutely. Yeah. Next, as you can see. Um, but it's, an, yeah. it's inevitable because it, it needs is the desire for a more accurate mapping becomes more and more prevalent in statutory legislation. Mm -hmm. There's going to be more need to rely on the same. So, yeah. um, this is our best guess, though. This is a lot of it. Mm -hmm. So the archaeology site assessments that within the grid scope were reviewed on item ground truth and also any subsequent uh, reporting uh, in the archaeology digital library or from authority groups and influence the map to extend to sites. When you have that stuff outside all the archaeology that review took it. And even into September 2021, about the subsequent um, state leader which took all the data up. Yeah, what were the search for that? So, up to this further issue. Just before you move on, um, and this is more a question for Mr. Mugami, um, I'm just looking at your annexures two and three where it mm -hmm. that, um, talks about those changes to the map to extent. Um, just wondering whether if the changes that have come out through the review process have extended the line in some areas, is there a scope issue in terms of extending? Um, some of them narrow it, that's fine, but if it goes beyond what was notified in terms of the extending, we've now got a bigger area. Is that... Yeah, that's not in scope. That is in scope. But, but the site's where we did change and we can simply get Yeah, no, I'll, I mean, ultimately, there's a legal issue. But I, but I would say the answer is is yes. The, the you know, what, once the, if you think about that scope constraint, the scope, the scope of the plan change is confined to the um, proposed uh, sites that were intended to be included in the district mm. plan. So to the extent that there's any um, anything to be excluded, it's other sites that aren't notified. But in terms of those sites that are notified and were part of the notified version, the exact mapping extent of those particular sites and whether or not there's to be a you know an evidential debate about you know where the exact mm. boundary should sit, I would submit that is very definitely within scope. So, so, for example, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at Mr. Cable's A10 um, on page 79 of 154. And there's a, there's a, there's a yellow tongue that is now being recommended in the, in the southeastern mm. corner, which goes into another property which wasn't previously in the notepad. Mm. So it's mm -hmm. a case in point. So <clears throat> your, your submission not only is that that is we don't have to worry about that. That is the deal. Okay. It's like they're being sent again the outside, but you go that larger than that one of the on the Right. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah. yeah. Just, <laughs> um, um, I guess I'm just a little bit concerned that we are going into properties that weren't affected in the notified plan, whether there might be a clear water issue, a scope issue in terms of would they have reasonably expected that through the plan change process that their property might have been caught? And there are a few that, that this one, um, the chair has identified as not. All of them. There are a few where there are new properties brought in mm -hmm. as part of the review. Yeah, yeah I mean, I understand the, I understand the concern, but the, the, there is an inherent. There has to be something inherent in the plan changes notified to indicate to the general public that we 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 the plan change is identifying an archaeological site which includes potential boundaries. So. And my my I think my submission on this point would be that there's something inherent about that which should be sufficient notice to the neighbour or anyone that, that has land immediately adjacent that there's a there's a potential mapping question and there's an extent of this arc site which has the potential to affect them. Um, so you know I I'm not sure that someone 
like for example, the owner of the the town of the road <laughs> could say, I am I am blindsided by PC9. This is the, my submission to you would be to say that those parties that have seen PC9 as notified and seen that there is an arc site which is about to be introduced and there's a there's a mapping exercise which is inherent within that would say, all right, well I'm I'm interested in this. And I'm interested in making sure that, that mapping doesn't change or doesn't extend onto my property, for example. Um, you know, there, there has to be there has to be something about the nature of this plan change, which inherently um, on notification is telling people that uh, have an interest immediately adjacent to current mapping. But this might affect me, depending on how this plays out. This might affect. Me. Um, Can I ask and, when, when the, um, I know, and I, and I can't remember if with this particular um, topic of the, the process, but there were some letters sent to people that were you know, affected by um, good heritage and historic heritage area proposals mm -hmm. and things. Um, I'd just be interested to know whether there were similar letters that were sent out to people where the um, notified extent of the archaeological site affected their property and whether or not those letters extended to those adjacent property owners or not, I guess in terms of the awareness that Cavus might actually. I don't I don't believe so. Mm -hmm. Um and I think probably because as I say there's a slightly inherently different feature to this than there is to some of those other plan changes. I'll check with council, but I don't understand that to be the case. I mean, if this if this becomes a, an issue of concern to the panel, there is, I mean, there would be an ability to do some kind of audit of any particular proposed mapping, which is now engaging on a new title that has not previously been the subject of uh, the mapping. Um, and yeah, we can we can we can deal with that in terms of a, a communication. If, if there is a concern that there are parties that you may consider to be affected, that you would like to give at least the opportunity to make a late submission, we can we can find that small subset, um, and it could be it could be done. I certainly don't resolve from my my primary submission. I, I think there is. I understand the point, um, and and I think it's 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 well made, but I do. I do think that there is force in, in, the, in, in the proposition that there's something about this plan change that should, on notification, when it looks at the mapped extent of archaeological sites, you should be entitled to say, on public notification of that, we've given the public notice that there's an archaeological site inherent within when that is a, a mapping exercise that may or may not be ground truth or validated through a plan chain process. And it might change um, and it could potentially affect me. I mean, I think there has to be some real world acceptance that public notification of a plan change of this no nature is putting sufficient people sufficiently on notice. Mm. Um, so that, that would be my submission on that point. Um, but yeah, I guess there's there's not the other, there is the other part would be a way through. The other part of that, of course, is that is that if this if this then that goes into our site, uh, it's a fact under that particular legislation in yeah. any event. Well, an authority would be required, presumably, in any event. Mm. Um, regardless of whether the plan picks that up or not. Yes, yeah, so so yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But that that then you know does you know if, if, if there was a scope issue here on this, you would potentially then find yourself cutting off yeah. the pun yeah. for the purposes of the district plan. Mm -hmm. And then but but yes, the cable yeah. would diligently put the proper map mm -hmm. up onto the arc side yeah, yeah, and then we have a mismatch. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. There's a, there's a that might be part of the justification. Mm. Since it is the intent to align with the, the arts, mm. well, that's right. Mm. All right, we'll, we'll worry. We, 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 I, I will just just on that, that just to finish that point. We do uh, a bit of an inventory of how many 
remapping the exercises to engage in a an additional title, not otherwise already affected by the map. You can see that that's a great example of like A10 because you can see that cadastral boundary where the paint extends, which is look, looking like a separate site. So we'll find out how many um, new titles are affected. Mm -hmm. <coughs> the worry I have is that's the only one I turned up. It's the first one I looked at. So, um, it's, we sort of tag terms. <laughs> I mean, so I look at the district plans and you see mine comes out. Like some knowledge that I'm close to on the proximity, and I look at them all that time. Mm. And it only becomes an issue because of Mr. Cable's further work. Mm. An opportunity to take a submission. They maybe even get other other expertise that comes in and says, Well, actually, I'd screw with your opinion on that. And I would contest the remapping at the arc site level as well. Anyway, so you can have a look at it. Yeah, okay. Well, I'll, I will come back to you in an inventory um, and we can think about that. I mean, yeah, yeah, just just leaving, just coming back to that last point, though. I mean, if, if, if the, as I say, if the mapping extent in the district plan is constrained by the scope issue, and we ended up having a mismatch between the district plan and the, the art sites mapping. Um, the only way that that's resolved is through that individual challenging the arc site mapping to a different process. And I don't know if there's a, a process for that. Um, or you live with the mismatch. But, but the, the purpose of PC9 was to achieve the alignment. So mm. if we end up in a situation where we're, we're, we're producing something, some refreshed and updated information, reliable information at the arc site site, is not aligned with the district plan. I feel like we're undermining the intent of the plan change here. It's not a counter argument that at the very least we needed to ensure that those that were elected mm. were notified and had the opportunity to yeah. So I think if that if that's if that remains a concern in, in terms of the the engagement in Let's have a look. Let's produce the inventory to find out just how many properties are potentially affected. With that, that, that. Is, uh, I've made a submission in terms of what I think public notification in, in the inherent nature of of the plan change, but um, I, I hear you down with there. Right. Very good. Okay. Um... Just to conclude the statement of evidence, the activity site review led to the revision of the group rankings for scheduled sites with new information on the group reinstatement on the group sites. Reinstating information on the group sites deemed to be destroyed or otherwise to be published. Also, note the number of scheduled sites remain unchanged following the review as the cultural significance of these sites. Thank you. And, uh, not tied to arts, right? Um, arts, but I'm familiar with what the forms and that look like, but I'm just not familiar with how the process is set together. So mm. if um, an archaeological authority has been granted to d destroy a site, um, how long does it take for that to be reflected in an arc site? I'm just wondering if there's any, whether there any whether there was a need to cross check whether any authority had been granted to destroy or modify sites um, of arc site and whether there's a sort of like a community. Yeah, I mean, in terms of, of when they are, there is a statutory condition in the authorities uh, days from completion of, of works, okay. well, they're not cited, they're yeah. not cited, they're not cited. That yeah. um, pushes the boundaries to the police. Uh, but there is that requirement there that is once requirement. that arc site has been updated once that's the right. work has been done. So and certainly there's a five yeah. requirement on the report to go to here New Zealand, not the Heritage New Zealand for their approval, yeah. which also contains site update information. So it's why I've reviewed not just arc site, but also the Heritage New Zealand's yeah. digital library in case there were 
submitted authority reports, they haven't yet been updated in that so. So, October, uh, as far as the release information is, uh, we're up to that. <clears throat> so that's your paragraph 18, when you say that, that, that the digital library was also service for level of reports. True. Yeah. yeah. And that you said was up for the sixth floor. Well, the subsequent view in the So thank you, uh, it just depends on the summary of the rebuttal evidence. Uh, I've provided rebuttal evidence in response to the matters raised by submitted and recorded a lot of in the security networks. Uh, in summary, I disagree with the views presented and is read back by the evidence. Also provided further comment on the methodology used to support the benefit of the group of Campbell. And further to this, and answer to the question earlier on, uh, only one new activity site can be recorded. With them having to consider boundaries uh, since notification, and I recommend that that is included to ensure that we do so. The Franklin Railway Station, uh, in the Patton Garden, 19th century aspects of improvement, we should be included in. It depends on that, and to Joe and I, maybe it is an East Bend Railway from a planning perspective, but uh, I think I raised it. Uh, um, is, is the, I'm a little concerned at the idea of um, simply maintenance on an existing footprint or renewal on an existing footprint would trigger um, a resource consent process. Um, could, could you help articulate again why you feel that when it's confined to the footprint, why there is this concern? Oh, you know, it's very, very yeah. um, so I know that particularly in regard to our metrics, that they have closer wires at the top of the city sites and know exactly the GPS put on something like What they will not be able to tell you is how big the trench is that put that wire in for the best. 600 mil bucket or the 1.2 mil bucket or the 1 mil bucket based on contract. Subsequent to that, the new contractor having to replace, repair, or do any work. Now, they need to make it very clear about it for the 600 mil bucket. And what are the chances of them hitting the same line as the first digger when there's no service indications as to where that trench line? And so that, that is the same process that they would have to go through uh, in an earlier application to visit New Zealand here. Um, so there's an earlier process, right? And there are two processes to get. Do they not have to provide the same information? Well, in, in regard to so under the HNZPDA, yeah. so what would be expected there? Is that they would know if they're on an active a known active site, and that's the best thing to have. And if they know they're on a known active site, uh, then they look by uh, bring in an expert to provide an assistant for advice, and, and then subsequent uh, apply to authority to be destroyed, and then you try to the final permission that allows them to uh, mitigate the damage by recovering any active generation. Which does between uh, 100 mil of a midden along the left hand side of the trench to make this thing. The true expert evidence that there's not a duplication. Oh, the authority process isn't a particular process. So it has a duplication. The only duplication is the end of the act, its size. Authority uh, isn't the duplication of its size. Yet yeah, I've done a couple of the truck comments that can be very The district plan provides a protection. Or just an ability to comment on the site first. It's appropriate to be put in that work that can be sort of made through the power site. I couldn't make this work. I don't have to do that now. It is certainly thorough that this is a very immediate truth. Although they do have the power to refuse authorities. Very, very mm -hmm. uh, thorough to refuse them. Yeah. Uh, and, and normally the authorities would clearly, well, the authorities would clearly because it doesn't make quite much time really. But we're doing the problem. Same. Excuse me, I hate the ability of it. 
have been chosen to uh, to manage the model. Similarly, the discovery from which is often often uh, on top of the simulation that virtually is probably one of the activities on which is returning to the body of the 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 liability of this with primary uh, my my primary end of Jesse Mind is to illuminate really known sites for you to make that process more and more uh more visible to both actually we could say you put no one to line up to the site and you might want to prove them for this script but from the beginning of the button um big limitations for getting to my delivery site with the online delivery site where there's not yeah we're just taking a reason to switch to the room. That's the that's a piece that needs to be there. And if it's mine, I'm illuminating where the where the nine sites are. I guess the papers and the charts are there and say, oh, I don't know if there's a site here, I did some stuff. Um, there is no really like the site like, short of content and practitioners stopping or or content back to all the work in some way to a part of the but welcome before us later on today and say, well, we know where our cables are because we can we can track the cables. Yes. Um, and typically we would lay cables in the middle of strength, so we know we know that. Your response to that would be have a ticket bucket that um having this ticket bucket that can't afford to use to the mm -hmm. I would have been to the part of the above, when you say it's just like pop holding to find it. Yeah, because it is. <clears throat> but if they tell us that you know, tank for bigger ones, they're using these days are smaller than bigger ones. They used to be, and then it used to be the boost of people. Mm -hmm. it, well, that's such a real thing to start with. Because if you know the, you know the same location on the edges of the original print, sure. yeah. then that's fine. That would answer the question. Yeah. And I would, I would ask, I would, I would, I would give you that, unless there's a service market. It's always going to be stickier for the is the reason why mm. wouldn't guarantee they wouldn't have to move around on the Yeah, they guarantee. <clears throat> yeah. yeah, so the challenge gets thrown back on them. Sorry. The challenge gets thrown back on them, basically. Well, that's right. right. That's right. And my experience is in front of people, I'll put the front of You know, you can sign that as you know, but you can get a photo. We're different about that. Um, no, the credit's still the same. If you can, and again, using our obligations, I provide advice from the market, not just the same too. So I don't know if you can. It's really more about a static agency that affected the ship after a lot. It's now this. Yeah, I'm just wondering, are there, are there not techniques and things that could be referred to as permitted activity standards in your view that would find a pathway through this issue? No. No, I, I, I think it's going to be directional driven. The experience of hydrogenic excavation. Uh, I've had experience of changing and molding and then, you know, put features back. And all of those occasions I've been able to pull out of So every, every, every one of those methods introduces a way to put out of the method. Or has the ability to damage our capability. That's what I said. The only, like I said, the only way that so when so when in my neighborhood they come out and they mark the footpath up in about 20 million different colors and this is hieroglyphics yeah. of yeah. you know this point here and it's yeah. six point six below the ground and what have you this is where so that's that's so I'm not that accurate, is it? Oh, it will always require a whole thing. Right. 
and Poland was digging out, digging a hole yes. to confirm where it is. And that's that picture right there. What instantly introduces the risk of because yeah. when they do that, of course, their concern is they're not going to, when they're looking for water, they're not going to be picking up electricity or well, fiber optics, those gas pipes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it, it's not so much the, and yet I have no issues with the well, comment that within the existing trenches, the steward is safe. Yes. No outside the room to understand ground. That's But what's the message for utilities going forward? Now? Is it, is it, I mean, because GPS is accurate, but within the field, so that, even that wouldn't stay. Are you recording and monitoring GPS coordinates? Yeah. Oh, that would be so good if you were over the same elements or what? Uh, and what can you consider? Like, how much do you know? Um, I, it's impossible to guarantee the scientific nature of the reality of stuff right now. Mm. That's what I'm hearing. Yeah. Yeah. I'm hearing there isn't a thing. Yeah, so I mean, like in mm. modern day, I mean, you, you do create a new subdivision and you have to lodge an as dot with a you know, cross section of the road and it locates where each of those huge lobbies must be. I mean, that's getting fairly exact, isn't it? The, uh, the, the premise of historic archaeology is from the PS that I'm not so sure is in the Ruins might be accurate. Again, do they show the trench? It's not so much the tool as it's the trench. You can see the and the only way you can find the trench, I have a photograph of one of you, just look at it. <laughs> it's quite it's heading down, and then hopefully you would be more or on the same trench or not on site. It should be along the line of the service will be there within the trench to see the trench pattern. Mm -hmm. Um, the first was the question I put to Mr. Mo down, um, down there around the um, the relabeling yep. of borrow pit with Māori core culture yep. and whether it's substantive difference or whether it's just a change of label and whether it has an impact in terms of the rules that it contributes. So it's a change, it's, it's, it's a, it's a non-architecture change um, to be consistent. Um, these two market capital projects, for example. And from the archaeology point of view, the terms are insufferable. Um, Allegedly, the borrow is used in art site to refer to um, a port culture there anyway. So borrow pits are the borrow pits where uh, the, the famous, famous or alluvial levels are uh, dug out and then scattered as kind of follow around. So how do around that part of it? Mm -hmm. So they're in a part of that water property process. Mm -hmm. down, um, down the sort of thin bottom, face of the bottom. So that was a down the So it's again, it's characterizing a horticultural activity. It's not a different activity. It's the same activity. Mm -hmm. Might have been a project of water turn. It mm -hmm. was just bringing it down the soil. Mm -hmm. so, so it's a term more accurate that describes how art site is recording these. So that's right. So the term borrow, it might like the term part of the map on, but it doesn't mean you have to be consistency in that, a more accurate. And there's no difference in the rule framework that applies to borrow pit. So, so the term by effect will go out of the lexicon, so I would say. Yeah. It'll be in the description. Yeah. And then my only other question um, relates to um, um, oh, changes. It, um, in relation to your, it's your primary evidence and 
in your conclusion, you recommend um, the inclusion of some wording in, in PC9. Um, and then in group three, we've got the a description of what group three covers. And it's just the it's just one word actually. Um, in the last line, it says, um, well, it describes what falls within that. It says a site with no or unclear archaeological context, such as an artifact crime spot or site recorded from hearsay. Um, and my question is, is that sort of a, a term of art for hearsay in the archaeological context? And what's intended by that? Um, whether you're saying it's an absence of um, written documentary evidence, I'm just very mindful that um, you know, my approach is an oral tradition, and I don't regard that as hearsay. And so I'm just, yeah, I'm wondering if that's the appropriate word to be yeah, used. Yeah, that's the word used in the uh, So there's one example, actually, is that very difficult. Uh, there is an R site. Uh, it's reported in R site as not hearsay. Mm -hmm. I'll just go through that term of course. Mm -hmm. um, the specific reference is, yeah, it must be a written, written document. No, this is the category is the same. Uh, the, the key definition for an archaeology site is that this is a physical treatment. Mm -hmm. uh, and notions of building the system can be perfectly located where they are as other than it's on the board. It's in theory. Yeah. Uh, hopefully, or, uh, hopefully, with the, uh, the subsequent cultural uh, mechanics. I'm not guessing that more appropriately scheduled mm -hmm. than something else, but but some of it, in this case, the actual context is the key to find that. I'm making the use of the hearsay because it duplicates what's in that site, but for a site that don't have a specific physical location, a bit more location, a bit more visible location. One ought to know if there's a site there, mm -hmm. but it might not necessarily be attached to a particular location. As well as broad and the actions that we have, we find fine spots in the general area that should be an indication there might be risk, but in terms of the district down prices, people the property and say, we want this property right here, and maybe more. So it's a box of Any issue with changing it to something like site recorded from oral tradition for little to good or 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 something like that. Oh, uh, to, that that's my concern is the hearsay and the connotations that go with that too. Yeah. Um, uh, no problem, because there isn't an old tradition behind it. That 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 has been reported and written down. Mm. It's a it's a it's a reference uh and reported speech in <clears throat> I think there's a, there's a strong suggestion that we've gone and changed the lecture of the art. <laughs> yeah. 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 If you haven't picked that up, there's something. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, there, I mean, there is there's certainly a sort of pejorative bonkers <laughs> and mm. connotation to the word hearsay. I mean, the reality is that so much of the evidence will be hearsay mm. in a strict legal sense. Mm. It's going to be, it's not going to be direct. You only get, you can't inherently get direct evidence necessarily all the time of mm. archaeological and historic sites. There will be some passing on of information that has come and it's indirect. So it's got that inherent hearsay element. But I, I get, I get mm. the point. We need to find a better word. Yes. Um, I mean, it could just simply be, you know, um, such as an artifact finds what it's like recorded um, from old history or something like that, yeah. which is. Doesn't have that complication. Yeah. 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 You're just, you know, mindful, and you, you'll be aware of the case where, you know, what the high court has said, um, the fact that the high court is present with a pen and paper to record something doesn't mean that the oral evidence isn't to be given any weight. And so I'm just kind of bringing that lens to. To that, that really... Yeah, and on, on, on a topic such as this, it just mm. it jars. It does. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 you go ahead. You go. You go. Okay, well, I just want to talk briefly about the groups, uh, and I, I'd like you to walk me through again. Um, there were two groups. The second group basically is of low significance for information, and we're creating a third group. Uh, some of the groups that used to sit in that group that were just for information drop, sorry, continue their status in this third group. Um, but obviously, some are relevant. Just walk me through um, 
both how you've justified the elevation and how you've consulted on that. Yes, so, um, so I'll be given it to the skin just to get invited to this group two, which is the, the key issue on it. Yeah, and you see it. And the, the archaeology sign inventory was developed on the basis that there was a significant science and more information on the site. So the big change is we'll go through to is to elevate the end. So of course my my review was a case of justifying can those sites be elevated or what the information on which is which is the practice to do. Well the next question they were of no significance originally. The question is yes. why have they suddenly become yes. significant? Yes. And is it so right. that's, um, that's what it is. In, in fact, I've retrofitted the information that does apply and reanalyze the couple of the information. But they, they are not significant, uh, not outstanding. They put a lot of group on site, um, but they still hold archaeology value. There is still the potential for the very active of use of the condition. back then, and that is significant. But they also have. Why did it was going to be historical cultural or full scientific? So they have some merit, but not not a outstanding or high merit. Um, so they have attributes, uh, and, and there is actually the presence of the author in the world with that definition for the site sort of uh, and those that didn't meet that definition, i.e. definitions compromised, or, or, or there's no archaeology technique, so why would you try to fix that? Do spectrum information on the uh, Can I get to the earlier point of, of the sites in group two being subsequent to the review that were affected? Were they all affected? Um, those are the ones highlighted in all, and I think there are a of those. Uh, some are the sites with no arts and literature, so I haven't touched those, but presumably for cultural reasons, and you ought not to be the life out. We ought not to remove them. Because they might have made a decision to them, they will exist because of the movement of the movement of the planet from that first day. And the only other one was a flower on the site in the green view, which last time was done. That's the only one that is, 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 is unchanged. Okay, and then that's the answer your question. So I have created a definition that works for a term that I'm comfortable with. Yes. Yeah. 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 At least it's threshold, but it, it, in reality, when you still that, it's not significant and not destroyed, it will be your turn. I was going in down the same road. So. All right, well, that's it. I think it was fair. Well, that's it. <clears throat> it's a useful conversation. It took us a bit longer than that. We should just finish this session, but we will finish it up before we take a break. So, uh, yes, yeah, so I'll call us Ryan, please. Yes, thank you. Thank you. You have provided two extensive briefs of, of evidence, and we certainly don't want you taking us through all of that. So um, let me invite you to really just focus on the points that are still of significant difference between you and any other particular part. On the, on the wording recommendations that have been made. I'll start with just highlighting uh, two differences, uh, two points that I disagree with the section 42A of the board. And that's covered in a third piece of evidence. There's your second, 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 second yes, yeah. 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 So I read, I read that yesterday, so thank you for that. Yeah. The two, the two matters in which I disagreed with the recommendations related to policy 19.2.6 F, and the second one was the activity status of earthworks on archaeological 
you know, in political science. And the reasons I disagreed with the recommended amendment to policy 19.2.67 was that um, I thought it would weaken the requirement for on site marking of uh, lost features of uh, logical and cultural science. So I've um, recommended um, amendments to uh, policy 19.2.68. That's a paragraph 14 of my second supplementary within that amendment. I've also recommended an explain, extended explanation of the policy to give more guidance to plan users on how to recognize lost sites and features. With respect to the activity. Sorry, sorry question on it. Um, do you know whether the section 42A author is comfortable with the other discussion? Yes, yes I've had a discussion. That? My understanding is that. Uh, he supports the, um, the further amendments that I've recommended. That, that's on, on both of these matters. So on, with respect to the, the second matter, the activity status of earthworks on archaeological and cultural sites, Waikato Tainui saw these earthworks on Schedule A and C sites to be restricted discretionary activities rather than control. And but the 42A report recommends that they remain controlled. Um, and this would have the effect of requiring a resource consent to be issued for earthworks on Uru Park sites that are listed in Schedule 8C. Now recently here in Hamilton we had uh, an issue where Marty Wairere um, opposed the um, disturbance of an Urupa adjacent to the site of the new regional theatre which is under construction and um, that led to the a part of the theatre being redesigned to avoid the area so um, taking my lead from that it seemed inappropriate that we would, we would be um, making Earthworks on Urupa sites as a controlled activity. So I've recommended that they, that those earthworks on those sites be identified in the plan as restricted discretionary. I just and, have a question on that. I'm wondering why it's limited to Urupa, given that at this particular point in time, we don't have um, the site significance to my plan change before us. <coughs> and if um, in the list there, there are um, Māori sites mm -hmm. that are beyond just Utapā. So if the others remain as a controlled activity, then council have to grant consent, mm -hmm. no matter what they do to those activities. And in the meantime, we still haven't got that piece of work. I'm wondering whether, um, as an interim measure, it may be better to leave, you know, move <coughs> all of those sites as restricted discretion, so council's got the ability to refuse it. Consent if that's appropriate in the circumstances until that second piece of work has been done since that's been separated out of this yes. process. I'm not interested in your view on that. Um, yeah, I, I would um, be supportive of, of that approach. I have flagged in my um, my primary evidence and in my um, uh, my second secondary evidence that. Um, Issues which I thought would benefit from having input from from Iwi and Mana Benwa. Um, you know, I'm my expertise is in planning and not in cultural methods. So I would be honest that um, it was just it was desirable to have that input. And I listed out a number of um, provisions or issues that I thought would benefit from either conferencing or what we want. Um, um, you know, maybe pressing those matters in, in evidence. Um, there has been no conflicts in on those matters, so we are where we are. Well, I, I, I guess, um, whilst recognizing the sensitivity of the recommendation, it would be helpful to know what your position would be, provided it endorsed by the parties of the election. Where do you sit on the, on the question that we just put to you? Mm -hmm. Is it a generic 
your strictly discretionary that you would be supporting or not supporting. I would be it would be um a precautionary approach to make it as strict as um three groups on eight seem to be strictly discretionary. Mm -hmm. Just put it back there, just on that answer, is that in relation to only the cultural, not multicultural sites that are identified on ABC? Because there are some others, you know, which was Flower Mill, uh, there's a St. Mary's Monastery School, yeah. and also a railway hotel and a royal hotel. So. Uh, my question is, is there going to be a distinction in activity status? Do they remain controlled or do they do everything shift to others? Is, is the question. Yeah, yeah. yeah. My, my comments will be to the cultural sites. And we've dealt with that simply by putting an asterisk against those particular sites mm -hmm. and the schedule yeah. and, and um, referring to the asterisk or non asterisk sites and provisions. It's an easy way for the easy adjustment. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right, carry on. Mm -hmm. well, I think about the second um, area where uh, I think we we're, we're now addressing it. Yes. Um, I'm sorry, I'm trying Um, just the um, outstanding issues that uh, have uh, they've already been um, talked about in the hearing this morning, the, the well networks um, uh, issue regarding um, maintenance of utilities on um, archaeological sites. Um, there's the, the, the Mono Waika Fitty Fitty Paitiaki group. Um, I'm not um, diminishing or, or dismissing the the issues that they raise, which are clearly of concern to them. But in my, in my opinion, that the matters that they raise are outside the scope of the plan change, and this is not the appropriate forum to to address those issues. The other um, uh, other senators who are going to appear and. For Rachel Denise for borderline holdings, being in the for um, a beer company. Um, like to see you know, what the views that they wish to um, pursue. The Heritage New Zealand for Harry Panaka Power, um, they initiated uh, two sets of pre hearing meetings in, in, in the latest relation to matters that. We were unhappy about, and um, I understand that we've now reached uh, uh, agreement on without prejudice basis with uh, on amendments to provisions um, that, that they are happy with. But that's all I was going to say, and, and just highlight on some key points. Thank you, Mr. Ryan, and, and certainly it's always helpful to have uh, alternative wording put before us, and very helpful. I will um, feel it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So, some of the wall networks on um, that are uh, had quite an extensive discussion have already, but just on a, on a planning front, um, I understand wall networks sort of model their suggestion of the Torah um, rule doesn't seem to sort of align too much with that, in, in my view. But, I mean, have you looked at any other? Rules anywhere else in any other um, area? No, no I, I, I haven't personally. Um, the the section forty two A report author may may have um, looked further, but I focused on what well, multi networks um, have identified, which is this town, and then my evidence. Mm -hmm. so I I identify that um, it's doesn't provide um, uh, for them to, to uh, doesn't so justify what they're asking for. They're they extending the, the total 
provisions very narrow in, in, in scope and what really the networks is looking for probably well beyond what the total provision is provided. Yeah, no, no questions. Things right, we're helping. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, it's nicely confined. I was heading for uh, more than a few quarter to two, and we've we'll given us an extra minute. But I think we've done that. Well, that's the evidence for the city. Um, uh, unless there's anything we need to come back on. No, 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 no. I'm not sure whether you're opening remarks about uh, this being a lot simpler. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It actually turned out that yeah. 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 <laughs> um, it may have uh, yeah. may have received. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take a uh, morning tea break until uh, eleven o'clock. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll then resume with um, this one. my mm -hmm. um, well, uh, Mr. King. I think we'll resume at uh, eleven o'clock. Thank you.
All right. All right, that's with you. Thank you very much. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for having me here today. Thank you, our um, Kimberly Father, for bringing us here today as well. I appreciate this great and um, um, giving me the kaha and the mana to speak on behalf of our um, Afana and our iwi and our wider community and um, our restoration project campaign to look after our way forward in the city. My name is Tiko Boking. Um, I do a presentation as you do. It's going to be shown, telling you a little bit more about myself and my father and our family. So, shall we get started with what I'm I'm going to look on, on the screen um, for Kafia Tinwana, for Waipa and Waipa to Tinwana, for Pironia, me Karioi, me Mano Taitari, me Taipari, me Otoma Tariki, me Te Araka Tinwana, for Tainui, me Te Koyere, me Mata Paroa, me Te Araka Nawaka, for Aramiro, ko Moerangi, o Kei Moerangi, me Te Kuraha, Hey, Tahawa, me Parehamati, Stash Poha Suri, K. Whitesamo, me Tapoi Harari, K. Rotati. Koi Naiwi, me na hapu, Kite Taho Toki Matua, Wali Farimanaka King. He is his mother as a Kitane. And his grandmother, they are from Ko Ko Tipa, Ko Tipa, Ko Tipa, Na iwi me ngā hapu ki te taha o tōpi whaia ko Barbara Dawn Stroud, Karapu Mare, also known as Kerb and Murray. Um, Mare was changed to Murray during World War, II, World War I. And anyway, so um, Na iwi me ngā hapu a ngā te rāhiri tumu tumu, ngā te hako, hauraki, ngā te kuia, te rarawa, that is just a breakdown of my, my ancestry. Here is a, um, a, a wider outlook on my um, genealogy and my lineage to Araki with Ngati Koda and Ngati Mamu Kaipara. Start beginning with from. Oh, so who we got at the top? We've got Nambiri Katawa and Waimanui and his Wahine Kokoda to our ancestor Kukirua from the time we were here. I have um, put these here today to show you evidence or oral history of um, and knowledge of where I come from and who I am. Um, I'll begin from Hotsurua, ko Hotsuafiao, ko um, 
Hotuope, Kotimata Po, Kumotai, Kotuirata, Korakamama, Kakati, Kotaro Te Fao, Kohanwe, Konga Merika Tawa, sorry, Kohamia Tiki Tiki, Konga Merika Tawa, Kotakiao, Kotakahari, and her husband is Tirai and Maxi Magri, Kokorako, and his wife is Ruru, Ko. Kawai Manui Rawa ko his wife ko Kaira, ko Mate Muiawa ko Uetaha, which is Hoti Maria's brother. <clears throat> this is the line that we come down from the Kaira and Wai line. After Uetaha is ko Tirawai, ko Tsukotahi, ko Kahitaiki, Rawa. Rapana, Rapana comes down the um, Narangi and Amerika Tawa, the second line which is in the area of peacocks. Yeah. So, um, and then it goes from Rapana, Kotai Tafari Rapana, which is Mati Kunahia. He's a very well-known chief of Waikato. He did a lot for our iwi. Within Waikato, getting a lot of things back there because we couldn't really get a lot back here in Hamilton because the troops settled here, but he was able to do a lot more outside of Oh, okay. And to help a lot of other Ewe. But that's coming up. Should be that. His wife is Meretiana Moore. She is the great granddaughter of Kaifariki, who was kidnapped from Mataki Taki Pa in 1822, along with Parengao, who the Māori king's mother. Māori king's mother? Yeah, I think so. And they were taken to Otorohanga, where the Māori king's mother was saved. But our two Pana, which they're actually cousins, like first cousins, because they're from Natakoda and Mamini Kapawa. She wasn't saved, she was taken to Rotuati, but then she was saved by a Pikiao chief called Tefari Putara. So her, her children, whom of course, um, married a lineage, an Araki lineage from the same Papu or Ewe, Namini Kapawa, which was Paitafari Rapa. So that's the line that we come down, and it yeah kept our lineage, our key lineage alive. Um, so from Meritiana and Taitapere Rapana, we have Anaru Andrew Pupira Rapana, who married Mary Ormsby. She has a big biography in Auckland Museum about what happened to um, Rangiapia. Um, my co would tell me that she was saved during that time, she was alive. Um, her father is Gilbert Ormsby, and um, Teraiha Moore, which is Meritiana Moore's sister. So their children, yeah, became husband and wife. So again, there goes that lineage. They've kept that lineage alive. The Araki line, so I um, brought it back here and into Waikato. Oh, wow. Taitapere Rapana was always here. He stayed, helped protect um, a lot of things like Mangaharaki Kepa, Mpuki Tepa, and the southern border of Rauke, going up to Mr. Creek. Um, so down from that, from Mary Ormsby, um, we have my great-grandmother, Mere Rapana, who married Ngāta Kowari Kitsune. Um, they built the temple. Um, their children built that temple and the Mormon churches in Hamilton. Um, yeah, so Ngātokawari comes down the line of a, um, a very religious family, close, very close to God. Um, Ngātokawari, his great-grandfather, is actually the first Māori baptised in Methodist Church in Kapia. And through that line, he married um, Mererāpana, whose grandfather is Gilbert Ormsby, who was the Māori man that brought the Mormon gospel to Aotearoa back in those, back in that time. So um, we have not only Māori culture infusing with the Methodist and Mormon, but it's infused together with our culture as well. So it's become very strong. I think that's why how I'm able to be here today and talk about it. But um, 
And after Ngākukuare and Nana Mary Rāpana, we had my grandmother, Grace Tani Ikitani. And she married James Tapapa King from Tahoroa. Um, ki te hunga mate, ki te hunga ora. Ko wali whare manuka, King Rāwa, ko Barbara Karepe Mare is my mother. And Barla, so... Hope that was too much. Now we all know Muru or Tainu Hamilton. Um, if you read through this, it talks about our hapu and our iwi in Hamilton, the first tribe, and going to the second, which is Natahome. This is the full name of um, Tikitiki or Homea Tikitiki, which is the first now Muru Katawa's father. Then we have Nau Muri Kautaua, the son of Premier Atatiteki and Hassan of Perihi, of Ngāti Roa Tietia, the sub-tribe of Ngāti Mahi. We are the Takiya, the son of Nau Muri Kautaua and Hassan of Takiri of Ngāti Mahanga. Um, and then Kopari Whakahar is the daughter of Takiya and wife of today of Ngāti Wairere of Ngāti Mahanga. Um, then through them is another tribe of Ngāti Kaura or Ngāti Wainganui, also known as Ngāti Wainganui. Um, Waimanui is son of Korako and brother of Kaakotoa. Waimanui and Koda are the grandparents of Uetaha, brother of Kutimaria. I think I already explained that. Waimanui and Kaakotoa had grandchildren that married to preserve our island so I'll just explain that. Um, on the right side, we have the five, the five have been listed our indigenous tribes in the city, have ties to each other throughout history to preserve the adequate of our island. Each and every indigenous archaeology and cultural significant heritage site over 25 like it, located in Hamilton City along the Waikato River and within the Peacocks and Urban Field Development Plan are places of significance to these hapu, more so of Ngā Meri Kautau being the Tuakana tribe and direct lineage preservation of the first hapu created called Ngā Te Hanui. All of the past sites were created and built by our tupuna from generation to generation with the vision and led from ancestors 10 generations apart, including our ancestor Te Tupi Te Whenua and his son Te Inuai, or also known as Te Inuai, spelled differently, of Nukuhaupa and her possession of Uunuku, the, uh, the fork star, with the green stone in the middle. And up until they defeated the war party invading Waikato at the Battle of England. From Huturua to Tainui, from Huturua to Hanui, to Te Tupi Te Whenua, the 10th generation from Te Tupi Te Whenua is my generation. So that's me sitting here today with um, all this um, stuff going on. Um, um, just before you move on, um, can you just clarify for me, so there's the five hapu that you've listed there. Um, I don't think, I just had a quick flip forward in your presentation, whether you've included a, a map setting up the, the areas of interest, is it the entire sort of Hamilton area that falls within each of those five kapu? Just wanting to be clear on. There are like, I think about five gullies in Hamilton. Those gullies were the, um, were a source, a food source, and created the boundary of our here. So from Kumakaro to the Manga Onua or the Manga Harakeke in the south. Is it the south? Yes. From Duku here to um, Manga Harakiki or Duku Kraudi on the west side, so to the north. And they all have gullies, gullies which lead into the Waikato River, but also have, have um, springs about those. So, and you can tell by the springs like Titipa or Pariyarifari, which is the boundary between Mahana and Namari Kapawa which then creates that boundary. So spring created the boundaries between each child and each thing. Okay, so, um, yeah, so anyway, so I'm the 10th generation from Tsitipi or Te He is the 10th generation from Hanui, and Hanui is the 10th generation from Hotera. We all have a, a similar kind of, um, I think, legacy. Similar legacy where we've created things out of, I don't know, a, a sense of spirituality or, or whakapapa and, and knowledge and history. And today, yeah, that, I think that's a very evident kind of thing that has played out. I think a lot of my family would say the same thing or have said the same thing, that I'm like a, a reincarnation of our supernatural. 
because I do things that they would have done back then, but I have to have kind of infused it, not infused it, but it's played out in, in a modern society that we live in today. Um, so anyway, so in 1863, Nazi white leader were invited here to help protect our Fenua against the troops in exchange for some Fenua. Um, and that that proof, that evidence is located at Pukete Park on the signboard. Um, they were not invited here to take over our title here. They were here, to, you know, to share it. And there was an offering that they have to help us protect it. Um, more, more, more information about this point in time can be found there. Our past site, Pukete Park, and Pukete. So just to be clear on that point, um, on what your submission is to us, are you saying that Nazi Waire there are not Tangata Whenua of the, the whole area, or not are only Tangata Whenua of some, or not Tangata Whenua of all? They are, they are some, some areas, not all. And your submission is that the five Tangata that you've mentioned are Tangata Whenua of the entire area? There's a photo of me with my Te Kūnanga o Te Atikanga level 4 class of Te Wananga o Te Arua Raro Era Pā while campaigning in, on Paul Road to protect our wahitaka and hikos. So during that entire time, I was studying, getting my um, qualification to move up a little level in TV. And it was, yeah, very difficult. Um, very difficult time, but I graduated, got my certificate. Mm. Um, what do you call it? A significant power site of Namuni Kataro in North Dakota. This power site was built by our Tupuna that built Nuku Ho Power Smart. Um, it's also called um, the Lookout. Um, it looked over all our power sites within the area and even over the British that were coming into trade with the Australians. And um, because, so there's a bay area there that the British would come through and trade for Harakiki and um, the sails, they'd get us their sails from here so that they could travel around the world. And um, it's not a mystery, so not really a mystery to us. I mean, it's mystery creep, but it's not really a mystery. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, so this was given to me by Gillian on that lived on the road. I think she still lives there. She's just moved to house because of the road that they just had to go through there. Um, yeah, it was very nice to meet her. She's I loved her submission on the first first floor reading. She um you know had our EV in there which was very beautiful. She even offered to get, um give us some of her Oikawa flowers that she had because Thanks that we deserve something like that because we weren't included in this consultation process. But we're there with her on that day or during that time period that she was staying there until 2020. Um, here is a little bit of an art. I actually kind of contemplated about this. I wanted to bring it to Hamilton City Council's attention. I still have the, um, the email of it and I was, I don't know, I think it might be a decision for you guys to the point on about if City Council is looking at this. Um, I've worked with um, Marina Hape, she works with I think Tangata Whenua Working Group. While I was working at the Tuna Library construction site being a site manager with Livingston. Um, before that I was working at the Park University but I ended up getting um, a more kind of stable position at the library of Zutuna in Makalo. Um, she rings me, she's offering me this job, $50 an hour, to work around our past site, that's it for me. Um, I was given um, advice from her to leave a lot of things that were significant to our area and sustained our voice because we didn't have one for 50 pounds, they've been taken away. Um, she said that I would be given, you know, a contract within a week's time. That week then led, then led on to two weeks, and then I, she um, told, yeah, gave me advice that I needed to leave this, I needed to leave that, and then to isolate myself pretty much from anything that had to do with that week. So I asked her a lot. I think it's um, nice that you've offered me this position to be a kaitiaki 
consultant or um, watch over the archaeologist and ecologist and work with them. But I think it's pretty sad that you're telling me to, to leave all of these things that help us, you know, retain our mana. But um, I just wanted to leave that thing to you guys. And... So just, just to clarify, um, so we are an independent commissioner panel that we um, three are not um, uh, Hamilton City Council. Um, and so what we're doing here is we're hearing all the submissions and receiving all information about um, Can Change 9 and so the things that come within Can Change 9. So more than happy to, you know, to listen to, to what you have to say, but just in terms of what we can do about things. Yeah, so our scope is. <laughs> I don't know why I put that in there. Just, you know, maybe it might get through someone and be like, hey, this is but we're so what we, on. Yeah, we're really keen to hear is, what um, what are your concerns about Plan Change 9 and um, what you would like to see, um, how you'd like it to be changed, but what are the key things that you're looking for from us in Plan Change 9 that would be really helpful? Well, I'm, well in that, what I was just saying, like, um, I was talking about our voice, mm -hmm. you know, our voice isn't being heard. It's not being heard on floor. It's not being heard on Tangata Whenua Working Group. I don't even really know about Waikato Tainui. I do appreciate Waikato Tainui pushing me into um, getting getting my RMA certificate and becoming a commissioner like the South New Greens for the environment and as Māori. But um, I think yeah, what I'm trying to say is, is that I would really like to see more of our iwi in there. Um, not so maybe not so much with thought to um, to how to be no at all. Nazi why like why why is it an issue for us to be sitting on at a table having a quarter to with you about our our way in top and our song on top of when you cows can sit with other people that have no idea or don't even care about who we are. They they know who we are, but they don't want to talk to us every time we see them. And when we um have to have a um a communication thing or something like to any way park where our ancestor was bastardized. In 2020, 21, and I had to protest to get that part removed because I was incorrect. And then in 2022, last year, during Matariki, we had, um, they had to come and change it and because they put it up without no finance. And it didn't take me to notice until after we had our, our tour, um, Iwi Hapu tour for Matariki on the river to go to the museum and then go back to the park and the home but stop in to visit, to visit our Tupuna's name and, and the plaque or, you know, to see, you know, how everything's going there. That's when we noticed that that was put up and we never notified them. When we notified Thorpe, it was, um, it's still very standard. So, so they, your group's not currently a member or hasn't been invited to be a member of the house? I don't, I think it's too late. I think it's too late. We have been disrespected too much. And um, in terms of relationship with the council, not, not the council, but in terms of relationship with the council, do you um, liaise with the council, the consultation, is there a relationship with the council at the moment? It hasn't really been since last year. I think because of the COVID um, fast tracking agenda that we through, that kind of, um, what was already set in stone with them, with whoever they were doing business with, was already going, was already happening, and we were, we were left out of that. So, so and if you were to summarise um, your key concern, it's a, it's about having your story or heard. That's sort of the key concern for, for this. And so the story change itself is, is in terms of not having to have, not having had the opportunity to input. So our future, yeah, or, yeah, our future has been put at, you know, and jeopardy without having to put forward anything that we have concerns about mm -hmm. when it comes to our cultural significant heritage. Mm -hmm. um, and it, our cultural significant heritage is being talked about, not even going being visited or, you know, actually I just can't go in there, but we can. That doesn't make sense to me. Um, I think, sorry, I heard one of the archaeologists said today about that. Well, we, we have access to those past sites and we have since 2020. Um, so I guess just in terms of, of that, you you would have, I think you were here for part of this when we were 
I'm not sure whether you were here when um, Mr. Muldane was talking about the separate work stream that is currently um, being progressed. Um, we don't have timeframes for that yet, but that's where specific sites of significance to Tāngata Whenua will be considered in, in, in a broad way, whereas this is quite a narrow land change that we're dealing with at the moment that's got a very confined focus. Um, and I, I guess, you know, what you're signalling is that you would like to um, have your voice heard, be involved in that, and I guess I'm just saying, signalling that there's this yeah, why are we not being involved in it? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, I think that's the biggest issue that we have and it's it's very um, very hard to kind of cope we're well, not cope with that. Mm -hmm. To understand like is um is this thing where we're talking about the RMA and is it being taken seriously or not? Or not? As a secret call, um, we certainly are alive to the issue. Um, we are limited in what we can do in terms of um, this plan change. We're, we're not the council, we're independent commissioners, um, as you will understand for having done the training. Um, but certainly the, the issue you put on the table is, is, is an important one in terms of consultation and one we'd encourage you to talk directly to the council. But if there's anything else in your presentation you want to tell us about in terms of things that might be particularly uh, relevant or important that we keep in mind with the plan change, please um, go on to make those things. I don't want to sort of show oh, about you. Yes, because a lot of the narratives that I've noticed, you know, this is why I put this together. Mm -hmm. The narratives that we have we have noticed a lot over time, and it needs to be the truth needs to be put right, and we have the evidence. So, you know. So if I could, yeah, encourage you to just pick up the bit. So this is just the archaeology area in Peacock that I had to do in the with um and with the Norway group at the time, I think it was in March. So um this is my two about my two from now, Pata Purirakana and his wife Mary Tian or granddaughter of Kai Faraki of Nami Patawa, the one that was kidnapped. Anyway, so um well our two from so he's done a lot, like I was saying. He'd done a lot because he couldn't get anything pretty much back from out of what he what he had from Hamilton. Well, yeah, here he does something else greater outside, and that was for Mahana because we are a bit of Mahana as well, so we now do a tip here. And it, there's a lot that he did, and in here, um, yeah, just really talks about in 1911 our two friends, uh, he um. Challenged uh, um, the compensation court in Noroa here. And, you know, he wasn't just a narrator, he was a man of mana, a lot of mana. Only, only people are like Ariki were able to do that for a lot of evening. And he did this, this huge thing. So um, he ended up getting a whenua back in Moirangi, which is whenua land from um, Patapata to Braggabar Falls, or also known as Mahana. Right, so we are Mahana as well. But now we have to is different, different language. Um, anyway, so to write about course, it's Mahana. So there is evidence that suggests and claim that we don't exist anymore under another area that does not have the same part of it. So that's not we don't come in and we have our own mana, we stand in our own. I think you understand it now. We need to, but yeah, carry on. So these are names of our um, whanau, these are found in the archives this year. There's a lot of them. Ngatana Muri is a short version of our, of our Tupuna name. It's our Tupuna, not a name of group. Okay. Um, goes down to Langatawa, Tadapana, a lot. It's a lot of soap. There's obviously a lot of us. Carry on. There's more here. All this can be found in the New Zealand archives in Auckland. This is where I got all the evidence from. Well, not all of it, but a lot of it from. Um, there's even Nata Koda in there as well, which came out of the Nata Tiwiki at one, one stage in the time, I think. Nata Tiwiki, I think there was a tribe, a group of Hapu that became like a couple of samurai or something, not a samurai, so ninjas. And our tribe, our Hapu, were part of that group. Um, 
the tropes, Māori tropes or something, to protect our little or waikato. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right, so that's me. That's the yeah, no, anyway, can we carry on? So this is a document which um is found at the archives. So, yeah. But it's, if you go in there and get that out. Um, but it's the yeah, 18th of December, 1911. These are the hapu on there recorded to get that land back and we're a part of that discussion of him standing up for our iwi and waikoso and giving this then everyone a part of what he fought for with him. So it wasn't just him, it was an This is him here by the way, whanau. Um, you can see, it on, um, see him on the live council. Not everyone can touch him. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of everywhere in there as well. And yeah. Um, we don't hate any hapu at all. We don't we don't use any hapu name when we address any of them. It's individual, you know. We can't define a entire tribe by what an individual does. That's one of the um take on principles of that. To do that is to Put that on yourself and your own tribe. So you don't um we don't like it, but we don't like it when others do it for us. Anyway. So um there is a corridor and the spot by someone who has the same gift that I have. I have a gift to be able to see things that happen and see my two come out that give me visions and tell me things or we call it the um the soft whisper and the soft voice. <laughs> and um there is a corridor in here with evidence that backs up that Namuru Katawa is not named after any dead, but there is a corridor in here which is um recorded by someone of Nazi Tamaini Paul. And her name is Tinga Kuira Nazi Tinko. Anyway, so there is no evidence that suggests or claims that our name of Kunga Amerikatawa comes from a group of tribes eating the dead. However, in the Maori dictionary to Ala online, it can be found in the Kaitu Kaitu And in this book, Ngāiwi or Tainui, supported by Waikato Tainui, and signed by Dante Tarangi Kaha. It explains the tribes that were a part of that debate and can be found with Whakapapa on page 250, chapter 39, called Turoa Tehunu. By Tenuha Huirama of Nati Samanipo and recorded by the amazing Ramatira of Kate Hidden Giants on the 12th of November 1937. Just three days away. Just a question of clarification. So, um, just so I'm clear, so Namuri Kaitawa is the E, five couple that sit below. What's the waka that, because you, you in, in, indicated a number of waka that you waka yeah, papa do, yeah. but um, is it Tainui primarily for all? Waka Tainui. Waka well, thank you. Thanks for <clears throat> presenting that. I mean, as, as the commissioner said, um, whilst within the plan change, we can make provision for consultation with Mara and Tante Benno. We, we typically don't actually articulate who that might be in terms of the plan. That's really over to the uh, harvest to actually determine. So <clears throat> you've made your case today and you've actually been heard. So thank you very much. My concern is. Now, six years ago, I looked at the blood. I looked at my grandparents, my father, my mother, and uh, my little brother and sister. And when we were in Amir Kaito, we were in one of that, that, that particular part of what Amir Kaito. However, um, our people are. Anyway, one of his children, another kid, he married uh, 
in the Mapoli, you have to go through that. So you'll find thousands of Nama and Kaito down there in the field. So we're pretty well scattered. We're pretty well scattered. But we were a people. Um, we're not our people in my native country for 1894. It is a meta of a man and all a ito mako in a tupuna. For now, we can tell he only know of all the bar. We are now the tainer, or tafa, or tafa, the matter, or two or a patio. The only two tiers were the And they matter. You know, um, when I heard that we, we were uh, not being recognized, Years ago, I pulled my clothes at the old man hotel. And uh, she said, Man, we've been asked to put in a plane for the clothes from Nati Yuru. And she said, You see, I've been in the clean. And she said, I'm going to get it. He said, That is Namri Kaita, who never has been Yuru, even though we descend from Yuru. Yuru had no money, and that's what people are doing. And so it's just um, some of those little things um, we need to be mindful of. Very mindful. And of course, the uh, Nuku Ho, that gully is a street. It was a case. It was a food source. So like we were saying, all those gullies were, were a sort, source of food. And um, I know no one else besides my sister and my brother alive today that grew up here. We grew up below Glory Peacock's house. Oh, Glory. He lived up there. Years later, I lived at Old T and his son Frank had bought the farm, all of Chain. So I lived with a pick up for a lot. A lot of years. You. You're familiar with the boys with David and Mike. Very familiar. We are not going to know what to do. We are not going to know what to do. And I don't want to know what to do. I was going to say, my mom, so I was going to talk to Papa Goto and Eve. Uh, <laughs> right, next uh, submit is uh, Taha. I'm not sure who's presenting for uh, Taha. ケケパカカトミ。パパパパピピラミ、パピトン、ケケミトポキトン。ケラポポフムケコノマテ。ナフイトタトウ。ディアンキタアキワ。ディアナ。<laughs> <laughs> あの、
I would like to start with um, uh, just, uh, just briefly introducing myself and introducing the rest of us who come along to support me. I thought I was doing this on my own, but uh, it seems as though uh, other, other people get the same pay as I've got to come in to uh, give me a hand. Little, little, little words required that they all know that yes, I do need a hand usually every day. But never mind, we'll get through them. My name is Rowdy Bidwell. Mm -hmm. I'm the manager of a child for Pennywell. Happened for quite a few years, and I've got another one better to do, whatever. Right. If we get important enough, we would like to go to initially before we go and play some mission is just to introduce you to to, to some of the people that are associated with our Japan, which, which you and know, and, and uh, in order to show you the support that they I never do I hate, so okay. Uh, uh, to get through to this, this PC9 and, 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 and kind of submissions. Our dependent is comprised of uh, five uh, hapus, yeah? And those five hapus range back to the time of about 1575, 1600. And they come through in successive order. You're my father, he's my uh, son, my uncle, uh, right through to today. And so, so we were able to, to, to um, uh, bring all the, 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 the corridor about these sites which you're talking about, um, to, to the table. And those five hapu are basically, uh, um, uh, uh, the first one being Mahana, the chief Mahana. Could I uh, uh, introduce you to, or ask uh, some of our members here to, from Martin Mahana, to quickly introduce yourself? I'm a and the 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 as a result of that, 
the daughter of Mahanga in, 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 in the Tamilapur uh, had a child. The child's name was Wadi. And they get it. And you, you get a feeling of where the where, where who's who in the zoo start to fit. After Wadi, you get a feeling of where the who's who in the zoo start to fit. And I have a handsome son like Wayne. Get out of that. Go back. Shut up. Mother, 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 How do you want? Mr. White, he went on to have uh, several wives and several kids. And, and, and some of those kids uh, uh, got up with or uh, come in contact with um, a fellow from, uh, from Cambridge School, Kuruki. And, and he went and he went out to have um, um, several kids, several children. And one of them, or two of them, two of them were uh, happy. And Hauer. Hapi was uh, not the Koroki character, and Hauer is not the Hauer out of out of um, out of um, uh, at Morrisville, and then later coming back into Hamilton. And so, Gilda, Gilda, the mother totally did the Bible, wife of the death. Harry also in the home, repeated the wrong, the Hauer, the Finn, or Kitty Kitty. That's Maria, Gilda. And since then, they, 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 each of those uh, two winners went on to have their own family, so they went down and they went out, and they went down and they're still there today. So they're, they're, uh, they're, they're, they're offspring, they're, they're descendants. Are all still there today in and around Kitty And so, what we've been able to do over, over the last few years or so is bring those five hapus together. I mean, because they, they were related, one, one looks after the other, and if one gets out of the child, one you know, can get back in line. Blah, blah, blah. And so, we we're able to to provide a uh, continuous, um, um, what about we do, continuous um, uh, um, certainty, continuous enduring. Um, and commentary, uh, discussion, consultation, uh, and, and answers, resolutions to, to not just consents, but, but to, 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 to anything that's going on, particularly around consents, I believe, for what? You know, it's a question, what is our, what is our purpose, what's our objective, what's our purpose? And whilst, well, whilst, um, and not so many words, you know, I've tried to put them here, there are purposes all around time. Contributing to the, the ongoing welfare, well-being, identity of Kirikiri Law through to and its impact upon the national identity of well-being um, and, 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 and in terms of the international arena, which was then which then will and presumably benefit everybody in in Aotearoa. So 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 we don't intend well, we we've never we've never um, uh, tried to 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 be all things to everybody. For example, we don't do uh, um, social services. We're not a provider of services for well I also even have pretty much without the experts. Our expertise is, is, is in the knowledge uh, traditions um, and traditions of the history of the those four or five hundred years of, uh, of Koyo. We brought to the table for consideration with when others are considering doing something in the city around the environment. Really, developments are one of the big things that are going to, to impact upon the city, or any city, 
uh, going forward. Uh, and so therefore, our role was always been to, to <coughs> provide, um, um, provide a, 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 some ideas, some fully around how that development might impact upon our values, our history, our core law, which then may not be elevated to the appropriate level of where we're trying to get to, and that is to, 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 to enable the city and the country to be a better place internationally going forward for Māori and Māori and 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 so 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 we've been in this game for 20 years now, 25 years. And and we've seen a lot of things and they can come and go. And, and I'm not going to go through who's the best looking, all the all the all, all the hapus and all the rest of that that's we have heard that and we go and um, and that's not why we're here. We we're here to provide to provide you guys with some ideas about about where this PC9 uh, is trying to hit to, or going to hit to. And I'll summarize it, and I'll offer it, um, and um, you can ask anybody else afterwards um, uh, whether they agree, disagree, or if some other difference of opinion. And my understanding of PC9 is, 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 is all about this, um, all about, uh, it, was all, it was in before the national, so we can't blame national for it. We'll take that out of the out of the base straight away. Sorry about that. It's all about it, it, to me. It's all about feeding consents and, and activities up, and all of that. Uh, they, that the cities and the, and the country can be developed quicker or, or, or better or what are all those nice words. Therefore, to me, to me, what I'm saying is, is that that. Uh, the, the the council or, or the government or whoever it is pushing this PC9 is, is trying to say to you guys, the commissioners, that, that uh, if you don't need this, then, then that will speed things up. For us, we're sort of saying that, 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 that there are three types of them. Um, um, there, 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 there are um, um, uh, many, many but, you know, to put many uh, criteria for deciding uh, whether to or whether not to provide uh, for a consent. And, and Paul will give you heaps of those. I've, I've read his papers, so there's heaps of them in there. Paul, I, Paul and us worked, worked together at this council for, for several years now, and uh, we seem to be getting to the same, the same uh, situation at the end of the day. Rather than go into the detail of a particular uh, uh, experience or particular uh, um, 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 criterion, I'd rather go to 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 an overall an overall um, situation regarding what will to uh, what will what will uh, what will provide the, the decision makers the 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 criteria to think about. When they decide whether it should be or shouldn't be consented or otherwise. Clearly, their advances will not, and their advances is full. Me, and then the two of you said we've been running out of this game. It all comes back to the, the site, the type of site. Because the developer, he doesn't ask to develop a whole um, 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 area like, like a, a, a suburb. He asked to develop somebody's piece of land. Like somebody's piece of land. I mean, that's, all the, that's all the developer wants to develop. Well, then he says he's forced to put the house, put the, put the hub, and all the stores, all the rest of it into that piece of land. So, so our interest is, is, is for that developer to be. <laughs> to 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 require a consent in order to enable certainty around every Māori consultation. Yeah. Then that consultation goes through with the, 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 the discussions and we get through to the end of the day for remedies, um, uh, reduction of, 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 of adverse effects, uh, mitigation, blah, 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 which was then to be handled once the consent is provided. Yeah. 
feed in those sites in got archaeological sites in, in of recent, well, I'll tell you now, 30 years ago when we started this thing, there were very few archaeological sites in the country. You know, for about Owen Hooks and all those guys used to walk around behind us. And we were walking doing a site of this. Yeah? When the RMA first came out. And, and he was taking away the night pollution and suddenly they were legalized and they legislated and now man. Yeah, so we were okay, fine. They respect them. They are sites now. They are sites of, of archaeological significance, and they are and they are uh, and they are uh, uh, um, part of the police of gang. And that's fine. It's all, uh, to modify those, you need a uh, modification order. So somehow or another, there, there has to be some uh, discussion. Therefore, if anybody wants to wants to develop near that, yes, you're going to have to have a, um, a, a, a modification order. Therefore, you're going to have to get into consequences of things like that. So that that that, that those sort of sites are all indicated for. By, by, by the existing legislation right now. Over the last 10 years, since, since people have, have, have got onto the, the idea that there are also cultural sites, uh, uh, not just archaeological sites. And I see here some people talk about some before, while it fits through to Urupa, through to Parkainga, uh, uh, through to uh, Funny, through to or Fanga Waka, all those sorts of things, borrow kids come into, into cultural sites as opposed to what might be a, an archaeological site. In fact, I think an archaeological site becomes one of something found in, uh, if there isn't, it, it remains as a cultural site, whatever. But then, as a cultural site, it's important to the, 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 the happy and the people of the, of the area. What I'm saying here is that over the last 500 years, it's these guys here. So, so what they, they, they're interested in is just to have those cultural sites recognized so that it, they can be um, um, dealt with, uh, 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 um, very similar to, to, to archaeological sites, which have got that tag on them. And, and there's a whole lot of lists around there that, that, that show that, that these, these, archaeological sites, these, these cultural sites and archaeological sites are, are, are identified. And it's okay. So, 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 so the ones that um, that uh, um, are um, most important, or again, becoming more and more important to us these days, are those that who haven't got a site, cultural, archaeological, of importance. And that's probably my seen in city, any city, not just not just any city. You know, any city. And, and the only, the only um, uh, historical, traditional um, uh, couriers come forward are for those which have been developed. Oh, those secular, those types which have been developed. Any others, they could go on the undeveloped or the unsite, unlisted site until somebody wants to develop them. Yeah. Those are the ones that worry us. Those are the ones we, we wish we probably need to get some rules in around, around what, what, when, and, 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 and what, 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 what makes the developer or the councils force some sort of uh, consultation, some sort of outcome which moves towards the so called bigger objective, purpose, goal for the country that we're trying to get to. Um, and in in the end, uh, now what I've come to is, is, is three three categories. First category would be the the ones with the sites. The sites are listed. The archaeological and the cultural sites are already listed. Council has got a lot of those. The archaeological site got a lot of those, uh, um, and, and they should be they should be um, automatically uh, uh, consensus. So if anything any happens on the site, on a particular site, well, they should be conceded. Now, now, some say they're being conceded before under, under a previous development. Well, if, if somebody comes in and redevelops it, like around Hamilton Heath and Town, should they be? If you find a lot of them, when they were first done, they were done before 99, before the RMA. So there wasn't no um, 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 historical record, or there wasn't no consultation about anything. So so if if they are the redeveloped, redeveloped be the word, then, then they should be considered. Okay. 
the other one is, is, is the other category I, 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 I reckon is that we, you know, we if, if a development wants to happen, a developer wants to, wants to make, wants to develop something near an existing listed site, archaeological or, or, or culture, yeah? How, how near is near? All we say is that Māori history traditions are not contained in the site. They usually contain an area. An area. And that area isn't limited to 4 by 4 by 4 So, so I've been trying to do over the years, you know, these both here, We'll be trying to to, uh, to get to a stage where what would what should um, uh, a developer do and the council do to 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 enable that objective the, the greater objective to be achieved for these sites which uh, which have no have no uh, archaeological uh, site or have no uh, uh, cultural uh, information about it. Again, that's my percent of the city. What should they do? What, <laughs> what I'm suggesting is getting a fee. The area should be, say, uh, within 100, 200 yards, 200 meters of, of our site. We'll do it next to the corner. No, the, 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 that, that'll put that site, no, that, that proposed development into the same category as has already been listed as a archaeological or a cultural site, which would then provide for consultation around the, the development in order to ensure that the the, 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 the big objective, you know, the, the overall purpose of, of all this is maintained and retained. Um, 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 and it's the shopping of, of, of uh, category B. Category C We've come to uh, a couple of little bit of discussion with uh, with with my um, uh, associates and what are those which do not have a site, do not have a um, a, 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 a a map that it's an archaeological site or it's a cultural site or anything. And again, I, I keep saying that's the majority of the city, that's the majority of most places really in the country. The question then becomes: Does it if PC9 allows them to be developed without any, 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 any consultation or any consideration for, 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 uh, for, for this overall objective and righteousness or beautifulness for the country and the people in it, for this generation and future generations, think of future generations, then those sites are going to be lost. Those sites are going to never come to the, to never see the light of day. Because we know why developers are developing. They're not, they're not developing for love. Right. So, so let's get real. They're not developing for the country either. We that far. Um, and then, so, so we sort of need to have some have some uh, rule or some some way of obviously forcing uh, the developer into into doing the same thing as a already recorded site, for example. So, so, so we we sort of come, so come to the um, conclusion that those sites, oh, or that those proposals, developers' proposals for areas which do not have a site on them, a site for archaeological or cultural significance, um, and I'm not sure. Ah, obviously, the archaeological sites would be listed on the archaeological register. The cultural sites, you find most councils are now trying to get to this. But I try to get more and more of them on here for the reasons in which I'm talking about for the for the betterment of the country and all the rest of it. Yeah. So 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 how how, how then might we together be able to to avoid the, the loss of that information, therefore that that history and therefore that um, um, betterment for, for 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 the country and for the future generations to carry forward after we've moved on. Yeah. <laughs> we think simple a simple solution might be, and I'm good, but a simple solution might be 
is where most developments require some uh, some some earthwork. Rather than just put them, you know, putting in piles in to put a house or a three bedroom you know, or a three story house or all the rest of on, on it, presumably as they go higher, they'll go deeper in order to get the, the foundations in there in the more um, uh, compressed and more static, uh, whatever you stable, et cetera, et cetera. So we think maybe, maybe uh, if if that developer was 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 uh, uh, going into the ground with the earthworks of a of a yeah, this is take a this is take a a a, 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 a dips. I got twenty, but I, I, it should be two hundred. <laughs> Very mistake in my in my uh, proposal and my submission. Let's say two hundred meters, two uh, sorry, two hundred centimeters, which is just under a quarter of a meter. Maybe we start there, there, there. They they need to have a monitor there. They need to have a monitor there. They need to have a monitor there. Again, it's only called the earthworks. If you only call the earthworks, then the event was was sort of uh, identified and um, uh, accidentally found or whatever, and then the normal protocols would be, would be put in place. And also, it give us everybody an opportunity to have another look at it. Now, if, 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 if there's nothing, if nothing is found after one of them there, then, then, then we were right. We were, we were right to allow the, the developer to go on and, and develop their feet on for 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 me. If something was identified, whether it be a shower, whether it be a yay, whether it be a yeah, cool year, and we heard somebody talk about that in some instances this morning, uh, down here with the theatre, and we were about other cases too, we were sort of there, there would never be never be anything more found in the other. These things, these things keep popping up. And they, they're popping up in the areas which have been developed prior to the RMA or all they haven't 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 had any 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 investigation into it, you know. And so, so I'm thinking there they they they're probably other too there that uh, other people like Paul and his expertise uh, uh, can think of um that they might Without too much on the developer, because uh, we, we do understand what the PC9 and all the other all the other PCs are all about to try and get things to move along, etc. Et cetera. But we also understand that there needs to be you know, not necessarily an outbreak, but there needs to be um, some sort of um, careful uh, analysis either before, once the consent, during the consent, or, 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 or after something has happened in order to um, uh, enable the careful investigation and research before we lose them. Because uh, there's as others have said, once we lose these sites, they uh, lose in the uh, 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 I won't say what will end up as, but they are. Uh, uh, if you all know that, that um, um, everybody's been trying to write uh, documentary around uh, a modern history, a modern uh, tradition, culture, with the gender and the environment, etc. etc. So, so in relation to PC9, uh, they, 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 that's where I've got to in, in terms of um, how you might want to consider um, 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 whether they should be uh, granted without without consultation or consent or not no need for consent um, um, in order to 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 allow the city to move forward. Which I'm going to further do. And then you've got my two pages, one and a half page. And so uh, I'll leave this with you guys and put it on the table and uh, and uh, invite to be part time. And I hope so my my cohorts over here can uh, can answer all the questions for us, right? Eh? Yeah. So so I would just like to leave that uh, that discussion on the table and and uh, and, uh, and uh, invite questions to not only me but all of us that uh, that might be able to help you get to that situation. <laughs>
Um, 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 yeah, I found the two page are particularly helpful. I was skimming it while you were talking, and very helpful that you had um, provided some uh, suggestions for for how um, the concerns that you've raised can be addressed in Plan Change Nine. Now, I think some of you were here this morning when I was asking, putting some questions to the council about the rule framework, and obviously there's the um, the plan change in relation to sites of specific significance to Māori, which is still to come. And so what we're dealing with here at the moment are the currently listed sites, as well as some that are proposed to be um, listed through this plan change. And I guess what I'm hearing from you um, through your corridor is that it's important that we have the rule framework right in plan change nine. So what has already been identified isn't lost um, and that some of the sites, if they're moving from a, um, a schedule where a resource consent is required to a schedule where it's not required, then there's the potential for those to then be lost and we, at the moment we don't have that cultural input to those sites. So they might only be listed at the moment because they're an archaeological site, but there could be a whole lot of um, portals to be for which is even more significant that we are just unaware of, and then by the time this other plan change comes, it might be too late. Is that predominant? I think it's a good What people know, uh, seem to be um, missing is, 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 is a site is, and its importance. That importance to, 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 to myself and, uh, and others are, is, is around the, 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 the historic, the, the history of, 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 of the site over a long period of time. Because over that long period of time, you actually get the, 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 the events, the, the happenings, the, 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 the environment, the community, uh, the relationships, um, of, 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 of pre-European. Pre European. And, and, and at the moment, uh, no one's given us enough money to go and do the research on all that. Mm -hmm. So, we, 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 the, the Resort Management League provides a, a sniffer being able to get into that by way of these sites. Right. So, 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 and, and it's our fear for, for these un, unlisted sites, which is again one particular of the city, uh, uh, get away from us and get away from that. They therefore get away from the country. Therefore, we all miss out on that uh, today and going forward in the future. And yet, with a bit of tweaking, we might be able to capture that and, and, and for the benefit of, of us now and us going in the future. I don't think it's it, it's 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 too too difficult to to uh, to to foresee that that that, that, that the developer could. If 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 um if um uh, insight is, uh, and probably would if we found most of them will um um provide for that opportunity. But there are always some there that they don't you know, it makes sense. So um so you know, we suggest that 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 your PC your PC nine uh, classifications or or forcefulness or <laughs> muscle or whatever you want to call it. Hey. Um, could enable that to happen better, simpler, and quicker. Because I'm, I'm expecting that if a developer was 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 um, was to develop or look at a, a, a an unlisted site, and I'm sure he, 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 if, if he 
if there's a risk today that he might have to go back and 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 start over again, he'll probably come into the game. Yeah. We never actually achieve what we're trying to achieve here without too much coercion or otherwise. Yeah. Can I can I make a uh, comment? My name, so <laughs> my name is Derek Burns. Uh, I'm from Liverpool, and unless my mother had a, an unknown affair with some extremely handsome Mari prince who happened to be there at the time, then I don't have a skerrick of, <laughs> of Mari blood in me. I have, however, worked with Tainu for 30 years, and I worked with Namanatopu, which came before to her, uh, as a consultant, a um, uh, support person, and I do the same with Taha. The concern really is that whilst, as you say, the, the listed sites will hopefully be looked after, as Harry Pukki, who started Namanato Boy, said, the Resource Management Act allowed Māori to put the hand back on their traditional land. To some extent, the effect of PC9 is to take the hand off the land, because whilst the listed sites will hopefully still be looked after, the listed sites are a dot on the map. And if you look at how people lived in and around those sites, an awful lot went on in a big area far around them, which isn't covered by the dots. Also, in the area outside of there, there was lots of farm activity outside far and such like. If people passed away, they would be buried. It was never recorded where they were buried. Also, in times of invaders coming, Tonga, carvings, so it's like, were buried in swamps. There was no record of where they are. If PC9 goes ahead, then people will be able to buy, for instance, a site, move a house up, redevelop it, put in a three-story apartment block, that, which requires lots of work done on it, on an area which is not listed as a particular site. We don't know what's in there, but our concern is that if they're not required to have a resource consent, they're not required to consult with, with Mari. Part of the consultation process when people come and consult with Mari is that there is a set of conditions put on it. Some are uh, things to commemorate the known history of the land, where there is no known history, then there is a set of protocols that says, if you have an unexpected find, then you have to implement these protocols. This type of thing was demonstrated when they recently did the theater uh, development. We didn't know what was there. Sorry, when saying we, I'm talking about Tar. Didn't know what was there, but because our monitor's there, when they dug up the or iwi of a young Māori girl, then because our monitors were there, they could ensure that all the right protocols, the right character or whatever it happened. Also, they ensured that the bulldozer driver, and I'm probably being a bit naughty here, but they ensured that the bull driver, driver didn't simply say, oh, we'll push that to the side and cover it over, uh, which, which, let's be honest, can happen because they don't want the site to be closed down. So what, we're, what we are concerned about is that if there is no protocols put in place as part of the Māori consultation and the resource consent application, a developer can go into a site and say, take up a house, build a three-story thing, do enormous earthworks, and we won't know when link's found, because we don't know that the cynics there to start with. So what we have proposed is a solution to that, because you said you wanted to find solutions. And the solution is that if there is going to be a development there which involves earthworks, which are greater than um, uh, if 20 centimetres, but we really mean 200 to half a, half a metre, which is significant, then we would like to have Mari um, hapu uh, monitors on site to see what's happening, to ensure that if anything's found, the right protocols, the right karakia, the right blessing, the whakamoi for moving the house up, the right protocols are put in place, and that we can see and check 
what history is in covered, uncovered, if there is any in the land. And that's in essence our concern, that PC9 <clears throat> takes away the opportunity to ensure that, and we're only interested in the land, uh, we're not interested in the house itself, we're interested in the land. So we want to be able to ensure that any history in the land is recorded, is retrieved, is dealt with in the proper way with the proper Mari Chikanga. That's all I want. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Williams. Um, and yes, I mean, um, I think we had picked that out of uh, Raro's presentation, so we could have that reinforced. Thank you. Just a question for you, Raro. You, um, you talked. Um, when you're talking about your beat, your uh, uh, second tier, the, the, the B, <clears throat> the B categories, you talked about an area of 200 meters, right? Whereas your submission talked about 100 meters. So to be clear, are you looking for a 200 meter radius or a 200 meter diameter, or uh, we just see? just just your sort of sense of in scale, really? I mean, 150, uh, 200. Uh, I mean, we did the discussion. As to as to what exactly will will end up, yeah. I think the the yeah. at, at that point is it brings those there to a site. Yeah. It, 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 <clears> just the previous speaker had a similar idea and, and similar similar dimensions. I'm just checking whether that you get that that accord. So you, <clears> when you were when you were talking also about about your your category three or your category C, when you talked about no site and no marking on it. I thought you were beginning to talk about sites where in actual fact they're valued not because there was ever anything there, but just because they are there. Your spiritual sites, for example, which may or may not have anything um, yeah. on the ground. Was that were you were you in, in, in intending for that sort of thing to come into your category threes, or were you going to uh, propose? And I know this is part of a future stream of work, not what we're dealing with now. But were you were you thinking that those would be in a different category altogether, those sort of spiritual sites or the thing that we feel about the end is that um, these are just, just the, the 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 land which isn't listed. Yeah, yeah, no, I understand, understand that. I understand that. Is there, is there another category though that you'd be looking for? I mean it's quite useful for the conversation which will go on obviously beyond PC9. But I just uh, really try, trying to to identify or trying to do determine or, or, or categorize the different types of sites. <clears throat> well, one of the things that we're doing, and it's, it's not just for archaeology, but it's also for built heritage and also the heritage areas, we're trying to get a, a, a standard uh, <clears throat> methodology, if you like, that's actually going to work across all of those so there's less confusion. <clears throat> and and Staff are now recommending to us, I'm beginning to think about a three-step scale in each of those areas in the same way that you were proposing. <clears throat> so I'm just wondering whether the three the three-step scale if you would for all things. The, the, that's the three step this A A B C go related to the phenomena, mm -hmm. go just the lane. And in, in that lane will be different sites. Mm -hmm. Some will be recognized, uh, listed, and others won't be. And so, so all, all we're trying to say is that, is that the, the, those which are unlisted, the, whatever they are, could they just be a, um, they just be a, a park kind, or would they just be a, 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 a walkway, or whatever, mm -hmm. they, 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 if we don't look at the land, then you'll never identify the two, but how we deal with the matter. Mm -hmm. So it's a holding, it's a holding category, basically. Mm -hmm. We put it into this holding basket until such time as we know what it is, you know. Yeah, and that holding basket is just to do with the pen and having monitors yeah. and when they do start. Yeah. You know, I think if, if, you, if, if that's made a, a you know, rule for the developer, I think you, you'll find the developer will figure out pretty quickly that if he doesn't do this at the beginning, he might be caught later on if yeah. he feels good at the beginning. Yeah. Which is a bit suit to everybody. That way, I mean, that way we, we get all the leads over time and um, um, covered. And list of otherwise, and then we might be talking about the category probably of, the, of what's on the list and what's not on the list. But initially, it's about getting the, the, the slain and then and then the history and all that uh, on that list somehow or another to be categorized in one way or another. There's so much missing there, 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 there uh, you know, there's, the country could be missing out on that, on that major, um, the, Overall uh, futuristic um, uh, objective and purpose of the of the whole thing. 
Which I always thought were the Aaron Mail was all about the fish paint. No, well, apparently not. I could be wrong. Yes, yeah, exactly. Very good. If there's a question, I'm just, I just want to reinforce that underneath all of us, of course, we do appreciate the, the protocols that apply to anybody excavating um, the land so that if they do find archaeological um, remains or coeli or mm. artifacts, then work must stop. So that's been that, yeah. that hasn't been taken away, it's there, and obviously you, you're working with that. Um, on a day-to-day -day basis, I presume, was well, by responding to those requests for a minor panel and put the presence on a site in the way of monitoring and observers. Um, just, just on that, what, what's what's your capacity? You know, how many people can you call on to do that um, from time to time as needed? That training. We're doing that now program to site here in the city. Now, but but those are uh, near near um, this the this site. Put so you say it's a little bit but it's is is a provider that the village needs to do so. If it's not listed, the 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 we 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 are at the mercy of those uh, archaeological uh, excellent discovery programs, right? In two five years we've been in the game. I don't know what's like up north, but uh, very few of them come back. Right? Mm -hmm. Very few of them come back. And so if they don't come back, then they're not recruited, and therefore they, 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 they're not categorised in one way or another. And so we wait until the next time it's redeveloped, and the next time it's redeveloped, and so we, we'd rather catch them by, uh, up the front for, for now, uh, rather than wait for the next redevelopment, next redevelopment. And that's what's happened for a lot of the sites in the city. So they, they, they were never subject to, never subject to uh, our, our resource management, uh, 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 protocols and conditions at the time because they were done before, not enough. Uh, and, and so, you know, it, everybody says, oh, well, well, well you, you don't need to, 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 not in one state, you might in one or two, and the, and the, the, the theater is probably the one high profile, I suppose, that, 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 that disclosed that this is untrue. Just in reply to your number question, we currently have 20. We can have more, but they're required to have the site safety certificate if they're going on a development site. So we're developing more people by getting them through that course, but that has some cost to it and some time to it. So we are not constrained so long as the people have the knowledge of Chicago that's required on the site, also to get that certificate. So we're not constrained by a number at the moment. We have 20 who are active, but we're working to bring more on the street. Yeah, just, just one comment. Just one comment before we carry on. Final comment, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> this process is, 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 is all about getting to the end of the game, man. Getting, 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 getting everything to the end of the game. We can't do it on our own. You guys rules can't do it on their own. Uh, the council can't do it on their own either. My, my uh, some years ago we started so we're developing the, those cultural sites as we could. And they were broke. Uh, bloody rate pays aren't they enough, hey? Eh? All the rest of it. So uh, we haven't got so far. But I think there's there, there's opportunity for for all councils really to to if they could uh, develop that, those those sites uh, better and well right now. The, the information and knowledge about it, and there's a whole lot of them in the and a lot of information in the in the, the Māori land courts and all the rest. But I, but no one's actually had a resource to go and check all that information to to be for for a lot of the sites around the city of York to be able to say yeah well. There's a bit of information about that slide, even though it's not listed at this point. So they keep the record, and when the winner development comes in, developer comes in, you know, that it might also be a, a, a way of, of capturing those, those sites which haven't been listed at this point. And if you could make those guys do that, it would be great. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not a 
has an impact on, I guess, the geographical areas of the uh, Hapus. It also has an impact on the Hamakara and the Hood. If you want to look for the week, you can see a lot of that that effect we might have been. The hour to the moana. The hour to the sea. The river to the sea. So we, we might have to talk about that in terms of that. In the space, in the market of the space, everything the time I can see in the area. So when the PC9 comes into effect, we does that in our happy in terms of having a having a say what I'm just talking about. Yeah. Also, you know, also your happy it's about the treaty of white time. Because the PC9 on us as a treaty partner. So that's all I want to say to put the PC9. Everything that stands for me does that for us in this particular area we had to come with our market on the board, or come with our geographical. Um, okay, um, five more minutes to keep on. Oh, some other people. Yeah. Robert, my name is the short. Um, <laughs> Commissioner, you talked about these like, piece of paper or documents sitting in there that Alice Morris wrote. And completed in 2001. So it, it, at the moment, it's just a paper copy, but we'd like to advance that because we've updated. Uh, it took us two and a half years, three years to update a lot of that um, archaeological sites and to add more information. That's what we <laughs> right. I say a couple more minutes if you want to take a couple more minutes, otherwise, we'll close. Uh, the the well, we can now for the first time. We are now for the first time. We are now for the first time. We yeah, thank you to have. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
Um, Mr. Rice has just informed me that somehow I've been misscheduled, I think, because I'm here to talk about the MPS IB. <laughs> and I know you're in the middle of talking about archaeological sites. So, yeah. I'm not quite sure how that's happened, but um, he told me that next Wednesday, Wednesday is the day that we sit down for the MPSIB. Unfortunately, <coughs> I'm out of town, so if it's okay. Yes, while well, you're here, so we might as well we might as well make that. Um, I'm just not quite sure what submission we now look at. Yeah. Because I think you've made it. It's, yeah. a, it's a rebuttal slam. That's right. Yeah, it's a yeah. Yeah. Of rebuttal. Yeah. Yeah. Right, got you. Right. Uh, yeah. uh, <laughs> yes, I think it's probably because you tagged on the end of the first thing, first paragraphs there, and archaeological science. Yeah. Okay. Right. <laughs> Which is just a description about it. You can yeah. find it. Yep. Okay. Yeah, so Mr. Sargent is right. Um, I didn't prepare any um, supplementary evidence or evidence in chief for this session. It was um, evidence in reply to um, the second one for the adult. Yes. Um, um, I think Mr. Rice has when you're a, a one page summary statement that I was going to read. No? Yep. Yes. Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Speaking notes. That's the one. Yeah. It'll be, oh, yes. it'll be, uh, it'll be one of the numbers that I think so. Yep. It's one time 11 38. Longer to pull it up and get to speak to it. <laughs> three yeah. Go for it. Go for it. Okay. So, um, as I mentioned, I prepared uh, evidence and reply dated the 6th of October 23, uh, which addresses several changes that Ms. Sycamore has recommended in her planning evidence for the um, They relate to four um, issues, I guess, which I've listed here. So, the first of those was SNA mapping. Um, Ms. Sycamore has suggested amended policies in Chapter 20 which relate to SNA mapping. I consider the approach that HCC has taken to identifying SNAs as consistent with the NPS IB. Uh, a citywide assessment has been undertaken and SNAs are proposed to be identified in the district plan by maps and schedules, as you know. Clauses 3.8 and 3.9 of the NPS IB clearly set out HCC's obligations if they become aware of additional areas that may qualify as SNAs under the NPS IB, including the requirement for those areas to be included in the district plan via a plan change notified by the council. I just note there that um, that uh, PC9 uh, purpose 20.1D, which you may want to make a note of, um, that actually says additional SNAs may be added to the district plan through the first scheduled process. So that's already reflected in Chapter 20 as per the 42A recommendation. So, so what was that? Was it a purpose or a, a rule or a policy? It's a purpose right up front in Chapter 20. Um, I mean, in fact, it doesn't need to stay there because it does stuff everything through. Of course. course. Yeah. Um, but I guess the point is that the PC9 already includes a provision that is consistent with what the NPS IB says. Um, so for those reasons, I do not agree with the additional policies that Ms. Sycamore has recommended. The second point relates to Indigenous biodiversity outside SNAs. Ms. Sycamore has recommended a new policy in Chapter 20 for Indigenous biodiversity outside SNAs. I've set out the reasons why I disagree with this in my evidence and reply, including that it is out of scope of PC9, which relates to Indigenous biodiversity within SNAs. To the extent that PC9 is not able to fully implement the NPS IV in relation to Indigenous biodiversity outside SNAs, this will need to be addressed by a future plan change notified by HCC. Of course, the NPS isn't exclusively about SNAs. I understand from Mr Muldowney's opening legal submissions that HCC agrees that Ms Sycamore's recommended changes are out of scope. Noise. Ms. Sycamore cites the precautionary approach as a reason for supporting the new policy that she suggested in the session one hearing, which relates to effects of noise on Indigenous fauna in SNAs. I continue to disagree with her recommended policy for the reasons set out in my evidence and reply for session one. Um, I'll summarise those in paragraph 17 of my latest evidence and reply. 
Furthermore, my reading of the evidence on Plan Change 9 does not suggest the effects of noise on SNAs are such that significant or irreversible damage may occur, which is one of the criteria for adopting the precautionary approach under Clause 3.7 of the NPSID. Finally, lighting and glare. Ms. Sycamore's evidence refers to amendments that she suggests to a new rule that HCC has recommended for lighting and glare. Um, and just for completeness, that rule specifically excludes the Peacock precinct, um, which obviously was comprehensively covered through Plan Change 5. So I don't have any further comments to make on that. In summary, I consider the changes that Ms. Sycamore has recommended are inappropriate and unnecessary, which I understand is also the view of HCC. Thank you, Ms. Ringo. Uh, basically, you're supporting council's position on all those names. Yeah. Yeah. On the knowledge and evidence, you're referring to the evidence from Ms. Bullen. Uh, yeah, Dr. Balkan and Dr. Mueller both provided evidence, and I went through that and had a look to see whether there was anything that suggested that the criteria for adopting a precautionary approach might, the sort of threshold might be met. Um, I, I certainly couldn't see anything to me that indicated that that would be the case. There are some other issues with the noise policy that's been suggested, which I've covered in my evidence, and that includes, for instance, the objective relates to amenity. Um, so, um, we have 360 degrees on noise. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've covered all of those in my previous yeah. evidence. This is purely just in terms of the MPSID. I don't think that changes anything. Thank you. We'll uh, keep that in mind for next Wednesday. Yeah, sorry about that. Thanks. So. Right. Well, well, you're, one, you're one fewer people. <laughs> We're good. Good. Thank, Thank you. you. Ms. Williams, been very patient too. Thank you so much. You're sending through your two pages this morning. That was. Uh, that was received with the question of plea. Thank you for allowing me to contribute to this um, session. So, my name is Renette Joyce Williams, and I'm representing um, as a base of Naja for the Waikato Heritage Group and the Waikato Historical Society, and I'm a member of both of those organisations. Do they have a different cost, a different sort of membership, or are they pretty much they the sort of membership? Yes, um, the heritage group tends to be what is um, more professional oh. people with a professional background in heritage matters, conservation architect, planner, um, historian, mm. so on. But the historical society is more people who are interested in, in the history. Yeah, it's professional. Oh. So I do have a degree in archaeology, but I'm not a practicing archaeologist. Mm. And but I nonetheless believe I have the knowledge and experience to speak to archaeological matters. I have been involved in several archaeological investigations in Hamilton as a field assistant and assisting with reports. And as well as that, I've written the background history for major projects, namely the Hamilton Club, the um, Hamilton Hotel Stroke Theatre, and the Tara Riverside Park. These histories have helped to um, assert and inform the project archaeologists when working on those. I've got a strong interest in Hamilton's history, both pre and post 1864 settlement by the colonial government. And I've researched with and has applied to Hamilton City Council a thematic history of Hamilton, presented as a technical report, and a substantial draft of this is available online, which I'll be able to see. So both the Historical Society and the Heritage Group have interests in the appropriate management of historic and cultural heritage, which are greater than those of the general public, and that's why we made these submissions. The main points of the submissions were the support and inclusion of NZAA sites, as listed on that site, the inclusion of known sites that are not listed by NZAA, and also to impose an alert layer to identify areas of potential archaeological interest. Deal with the first point. Um, the Heritage Group also requested that the policy regarding scheduling of archaeological sites be extended to incorporate 20th century sites 
as in such as industrial sites. As Mr. Ryan points out in his supplementary evidence dated 6th of October, 20th century sites can be classed as archaeological sites if they're declared as such under section 43 of the NZHPT Act, HNZPT Act. Therefore, we uh, would disagree with his rejection of this point in our submission. Sites that are unique and highly significant with the history of Hamilton need to be protected even though they relate to the 20th century. And personally, I've always found that 1900 cutoff date quite old. It used to be 100 years ago, previous active. Well, there are any section 43 sites in, hmm? in Hamilton? Are you aware that there are any? Sites that are listed under the under section 43. I'm not aware of that. I presume there aren't. But an example of one that could be would be the railway house factory and the complex and yes. infrastructure. So there's a whole lot of railway tracks and roading all relating to that. And that is a unique site in the country, not just in Washington. And that would be a good example of one, a 20th century site that needs, in our opinion, needs to be protected. As an archaeological site, even though it's 1920s. Um, the council consultants have stated that they are happy to include current NZAA sites and have added the Franklin Railway site S14 bar 498, and we support that. However, I note that the HTC archaeological site inventory, which was rewritten, um, has omitted the Franklin drain, and that is an essential part of the, um, the wider site. And the name of the site does not include the Franklin drain, and this is an admission that needs to be corrected, and that could be undertaken. In addition, please ensure that the archaeological site is 14159 at 11 Bell Street, and that's the site of Bell Cottage, is also scheduled, and that this includes the well and the land around the cottage. And that business that was raised in the earlier um, presentation about the dot on the map. Well, that's the same for Beals, um, number 11 Beale Street, Beale Cottage, it's a dot. And that that cottage was built on an acre of land. So really the archaeological site ought to be that whole acre. It was being built on and seriously subdivided over the last hundred or so years. But it's the whole acre, and that applies to a lot of the historic archaeological sites in Hamilton. That was built on an acre. <clears throat> when you talk about the acre, is that <clears throat> the acre? Is that the title boundary, or, or it was, yes, yeah. but not not no longer. Oh no, not, yeah. no, not that's, being that's what I would have thought. Thanks, Jonathan. Hamilton East and Hamilton West. And yeah. Forgive me if you really know this. Were yeah. militia settlements, and the militiamen were granted an acre of land. Mm -hmm. So that's what they got. That's what they put the house on, yeah. the cow on the horse, yes. and cultivated that whole acre of time. Yeah. Or a, a, a unit. So you're saying that's the extent of place in effect? Yes, yeah. yeah. But of course, for this process, the adjacent landowner is going to be informed of that. So no. a little no. tricky mistake. No. Um, also, this site is 14 stroke 223, that's 102 Lake Crescent or Lake House. This, uh, that doesn't seem to be on the schedule, though. It's there as a built heritage, but um, I didn't see it on the archaeological schedule. And again, well, it's 23,000 acres, so we can't really do that one. Yeah. Um, and it's been majorly subdivided. But a few years ago, I did um, see into the cellar, and that the cellar of Lake House is accessed from the neighbour and impinges on another neighbour as well. So. That is not described in the within the um, archaeological record. Council also advised that other sites in October 2022, which while they're not recorded as as NZAA sites, these particular sites are well known historically within um, the sources available to HCC, but they do not appear to be considered for scheduling. It was interesting that the railway was picked up from our list, but the other ones weren't. And I refer to sites that include, but are not limited to, the 1864 sawmill site with associated tramway, which was operated by even as a Gibbons, and that's clearly marked on um, the survey map 
episode 201, which was drawn in 1864. So the tramway went both from the, um, from the edge of the river um, to the sawmill and also to the bush um, that they were milling. Um, the, the tramway goes quite some distance through several properties, some of which are owned by council. There's also three pre-1900 rifle ranges at Dinsdale, Franklin and Hamilton East, which we believe need to be recorded. These need to be assessed by a consultant engaged by council, listed on our site and added to the schedule. My colleagues have said that it's too late for that, which I don't like. Um, basically, what was my next point? Um, I find it inexplicable that sites which have been, have been identified and recorded by NZAA are not automatically included in the schedule in ongoing years. And that the schedule does not allow for this. And I understand that le legally it's just not possible to keep updating the schedule, even if NZAA art site is updated. We request that consideration be given as to how this can be achieved. Even if it's just an in-house matter within the council. But it's recommended that council investigate the feasibility of this matter further with a view to updating the district plan outside of the PC9 process. There needs to be an ongoing collection of information relating to the NZAA recorded sites so that staff can be better informed when we have to do that as consent. consent. Um, with, with regard to an alert layer, I agree in part with Mr Cable that an alert layer is needed as per his evidence. However, I feel that delaying the development of an alert layer until the next plan change will give poor protection for the history and archaeology of the central commercial districts. An alert layer for each can surely sit beside the district plan and be utilised by staff in the meantime. And I really would like Council to seriously consider that. Two of the reports provided by Council do recognise the value of alert layers. And the previous um, speakers, mm -hmm. were, that, that's what they were saying, basically. So many people think that the central city land is already so modified with the degree of construction and ground clearance that has occurred since 1864 that there will be no remaining evidence of previous occupants. However, archaeological excavations relating to the development of the Hamilton Club down Grantham Street and the Hamilton Hotel, the former who, um, Hamilton Theatre, the former hotel site in Victoria Street, have revealed between them, they've revealed 19th century shops, houses, wells, rubbish pits, Māori gardening sites, storage pits, and burials. And two of those burials, well, one was referred to before, um, one, 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 one. But some of those results were expected, but some were not. The burials at the theatre site were right beside the footpath, in front of previous historic shops and a recent demolition of another building. But they weren't within the designated NZAA site of the Yurupa. So the Yurupa was right at the riverside end of the hotel site, down Sycamore Jones Place. And the theatre um, construction has been modified to account for that. But nonetheless, my historical research did show that there have been already a burial found, two burials found on each side of the footpath on Victoria Street itself um, in the 1880s. And that's why it was very important to have the cultural monitors there, along with the archaeologists, when the digger was working. Up there, up there near the footpath. Not near the designated Udapa at all. And it's highly likely, in my opinion, because um, that there'll be other such material, um, not just burial, I'm not talking about the even necessarily, but other material of the cultivation and so on, that could be found anywhere along the central city streets. The Kitty Kitty Wapa was in the area north of Bryce Street. But it's rocky, and especially the gardens extended right along the river terraces, north and south, and um, even beyond um, the traffic bridge upstream. And by then, you get into the raw hay of the next part, your upper part, that's further along there as well. 
Um, it's already had the um, problem five driven through that one. Um, but nonetheless, we don't know the extent of two upper power, but the um, the walkway and so on along there would be part of, there would still be evidence in the ground that was not archaeologically excavated or roadworks excavated um, when that was um, developed. Things like that, there needs to be an alert layer, in my opinion, of areas such as that, right along Central City Street and back at least half a block up all the side streets and down to the river edge. Um, similarly, in Hamilton East, the power sites and cultivation areas extended for some distance along the river terraces. And they are known through oral, oral tradition and also several recorded on that survey plan that was done in 1864. The Māori cultivations covering a huge area, which is the word Māori cultivations, you know, several acres of it. And it really needs to be on alert for council stuff, how, how that can be um, undertaken. I don't know at this stage in the process, but as I suggested, there needs to be some way of putting on the desk Beside the council staff who are, do, who are doing resource consents, some alert that there could be material found in those areas. And in Brampton as well, um, along the, the first ones that were um, settled, first street that was settled from the 1870s in um, town, devised by uh, Frank Jolly, Thomas Jolly, um, 1877. So, the Commerce Street, High Street, Kent Norton Empire, Kent Streets, all that um, area very closely around the southwest end of Commerce Street towards the railway. And that would require a better understanding of the central, of the history of those central areas, each, and uh, potential protection of archaeological sites. Thank you, Thank you. No? Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, right, Yes, I mean, on the alert layer, I mean, the advice we've received so far like, from the Mordani is that that's not good in scope. I think that was right, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So our hands may be tied with respect to that issue, but we'll. we'll yeah. with, respect to with respect, your hands may be tied with the council. Absolutely. Yeah. No, yeah. no. Uh, but, but, um, yeah. And we're very used to having that and stuff. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Right, uh, Susan Shane Housley. And you've sent through a, a, a one page, two page, I think it's now. One page, excellent. Yes. No, no, that's the uh, the business school of approach to life. Yes. Good point. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Susan Halpin, and this is my husband here, Shane Halpin. Oh, sorry, just a minute. Um, just came to an email. Oh. Just uh, sorry, sorry. Just, uh... We're heading to Blackstar. Background information. We are the owners of a large riverside property at 11 River Elm, Bagstar, Hamilton, Lot 6, BPS 71459. Property has a land size of 2,460 metres squares and a house size of 400 metres. Fully renovated in 1997. Shane, my husband, has lived here for over 60 years. This property forms part of the Tiwatanga and is classified as a group one archaeological site. When we did the River Elm subdivision in 1996, we invested a large portion of the Te Hukapana Pa to council, this being lot 15 of 4,875 4, metres square. It was named to Hikawai Reserve. At the time, we were told by council we would receive market value for the land. However, this did not happen. 
Council lawyers considered the land to have very little financial value, as it would only ever be a public reserve with no future development potential. We argued our grievance with the help of lawyers and JP for over six years, but eventually had to accept council's payout, which was a fraction of the reserve's true value. In recent times, the Tehapawai Reserve has been neglected by council as has been turned into a wild paddock with noxious weeds. We have complained to council and have had no action. It has now become a serious virus. Very few people visit this reserve. A few further huge reasons we have is when we accepted council's reserve payout, they told us our house site, lot six, yes, would remain unencumbered with no restriction apart from the protective covenant on the shallow ditch, which is on the northeastern side of our property. This was evident with a group three justification. However, in 2012, our house site, lot six, was reclassified as a group one archaeological site. We did not receive notification of this change by registered mail, receive a phone call, or see the notification in the local newspaper. Hence, we did not get an opportunity to object to this change in classification. We were advised by Alice Morris at Hamilton City Council to present our case at the next district plan review. So here we are. Impact of PC9. We are now looking to place our property block six on the market and are realising how difficult it is for prospective buyers to purchase this property with so many uncertainties around what can or cannot be done with this property. Rule 19.4.2b should be amended to provide further clarity and direction. We are concerned the word and adverse effect is unclear and give money being worth the potential to deny all future operation improvements on this one in group two market sites. Decision we are seeking. Change the group one classification of lot six to group three schedule ACA so as to remove restrictions while keeping in place the protective covenant over the shallow ditch. Group three would show that lot six as part of the T or Funk Park for information purposes only. The justification for change to classification is a significant portion of the Tia Funa Park is already protected as a reserve than the Tehikawai Reserve, which as I mentioned is 4,800 odd square metres. Furthermore, there has been significant human modification and ground disturbance within Lot 6, which includes extensive ground excavations to form at the large house site, garage and supply vehicles, plus form the white driveway with ground. Thank you, Ms. Hartley. Um, I was just going to ask where the um, where the ditch is. I've got the area of your property. I see the driveway coming down. Is the is the ditch on the sort of yeah, it's far the nearest driveway down. comes in and then it goes close to our northern down, our fence line. Right, comes in and then it sort of angles out there on the other side of our fence line towards the river. Right. Yeah. On, on the north on north the west north sort of north west side. Right. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so it's all on that side. I'm not actually on the side of most of the reserve it's on the other side. It's yeah, correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's quite on the other side. Yeah. That was why you know, we couldn't, you know, subdivide any further at the time because um that bit was there. So we and our house was an original way back then, so we um you know, we worked and um, just remodel, you know, cut the side off and um, and then um, did the, the, the redevelopment for the house, which was extensive, plus all the earthworks, you know, back then in 97. Mm -hmm. so, so 60 years ago, um, 
the block consisted of, I guess, River Elm Drive and all the houses on your side of that? Yeah, the 10 acre block that the yeah. family had owned since, you know, I was two. Right. Yeah. Mm. So we had no idea when we purchased it that the pass up was even there until um, some of, yeah, one of the historic places came along and said they were a you off. Know. Uh, uh, yeah. Does does the area of Shona's A12, does that take in all, apart from your, your lot, does that take in all the pass up? Or is it no. more on the no, the, 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 the site. so it's our site, and then that reserve that we vested off the council mm. is that rest of you know the, the par site. So right. the, yeah, lot fifteen. Yeah, right. But the par site doesn't go further east or south along the road. Um, east because um the reserve the council it goes down east. Below us, because that's part of that reserve as well. And if you look at the map of lots of things, so yeah, that would be um, technically probably part of it. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Imagine it's going to leave us in limbo quite badly until something's resolved. That's for sure. Then one question I could ask, Chair, is when you say you entered into an agreement with your family, where there was, I think you suggested there was an undertaking by council that didn't remain incumbent. That was right at the time, you know, when we were just talking to the um, the planners and everything like that, you know, they said, okay, well, you know, best off this part because, you know, um, and... Um, so was it your suggestion to uh, buy the site to the council to turn that into a new service? No, it was councils at the time, yeah. Mm. Because, yeah, um, you know, historic places didn't want us to develop beyond our footprint of our house site. And that part of that lot 15, that's why that, you know, so yeah, we, we didn't, we weren't able to develop that part. We actually have a, in our written brief from council that if things changed and development was able to be done, we can push that back off council. So is any of those other sort of agreements um, sort of would remain on incumbent, on incumbent? Was that put in writing? No, not at the time. No, it's verbal. Yeah. Mm. Mm. But the fact is that we could buy it back if we were, if it's, but, you know, if it would have been able to be able to be developed as a subdivision of potential, then we, that is in writing. That we have the rights to try and purchase it back off council to so be able to develop it. The majority of that has been just flattened and, and little, you know, with farming over the, well, you know, for you could we even bought it and over the period of time, and, you know, when we owned it way back then. You know. So a lot of that whole area was destroyed. Hmm. We haven't had Mr. Cable uh, visit our property during the process. All right, well, yeah, we understand the issue. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what we can do with it, but, but we will, we will uh, yeah, we'll think hard as to what we can do with that. Perfect. Thank you. 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 Okay, all right. Well, let's uh, take a last break till two o'clock. We'll take uh, well and good line at that point. Yeah.
That's why I won't be done PC 12. I'll get a snoopy new guy. Are we good? Um, who have we got? Yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, that's better. <laughs> that's good. I, don't know, I don't know if they can get that buzzer back in. All right, let's, uh, let's resume. Thank you. And we're now with Well Networks. And uh, I think, uh, Ms. Brown, are you taking us uh, first? Or yes, who's, yes. who's going to address us first? Yes, so good afternoon. My name's Sarah Brown, and I'm a planner for Well Networks. Matthew Campbell is also here, who is an archaeologist at CFC Heritage. So Matthew and I will summarise our evidence and respond to the rebuttal statement of evidence prepared by Council's archaeologist Nick Cable, which was circulated in early October. As discussed in my evidence, a significant just, portion... Just before you, just before you, read, you read that, Brown, um, can I ask, do you manage to tune into this morning's discussion at all? Uh, no, unfortunately okay. I have not. Okay. That's right. It's just that uh, um, we were sort of interrogating the council with respect to some of the issues, obviously, that uh, uh, that the well is concerned about. That's all. Oh, okay, okay. So, um, obviously, a significant portion of our networks of lines and cables and other infrastructure are within the council's transport corridor, and well, and other utility providers make use of these corridors for our infrastructure. So WELL also has electricity infrastructure and private property where this infrastructure is protected as existing works under the Electricity Act or easements. So it's important to note that distribution ring main units, transformers and pillar boxes make use of these areas also. So WELL also supplies streetlights, telecommunication infrastructure, traffic lights with electricity within the transport corridor. So we've reviewed our electricity infrastructure within the proposed archaeological areas, and we have approximately 19 distribution transformers, 163 pillars, 54 poles, seven ring main units, and approximately 26 kilometres of underground cables. So we definitely support the intent of the plan change to protect areas of archaeological significance. However, we just do not support it insofar that it impacts Wales ability to maintain, upgrade, repair existing electricity infrastructure within these corridors and private property. And it's important to note that the plan change will affect all utilities and not just electricity. So the implications of the plan change are considerable. Earthworks within the proposed archaeological overlays in the transport corridor and private land would require resource consent where these activities are currently permitted. This requirement will likely be unworkable for infrastructure providers and result in inefficient use of resources. The rules proposed by the plan change are expected to significantly impact our ability to complete our infrastructure upgrades and maintenance programs and emergency fault response works in order to, um, to deliver a safe, secure and efficient supply of electricity. And this is particularly important when the country, as the country moves towards electrification. So, well seeks that the plan change be amended to enable the maintenance and repair of existing network utility equipment in the transport corridor and private property as a permitted activity. And as I've stated in my evidence, we found a role in the operative Tauranga city plan, um, which we suggested 
a rule or words to that effect to enable the maintenance, repair and replacement, including associated earthworks of existing established utilities within these sites, as long as they're within the existing in-ground or on-ground dimensions of the infrastructure and any existing areas of cut and fill. The rebuttal evidence of Council's archaeologist advised that, in their opinion, it's impossible for contractors to guarantee that excavations will so solely be limited to the existing areas of cut and fill, where there are no surface markers to indicate the below extent of cut and fill. And evidence of this view was during the Christchurch residential rebuild program. So it's our view that it's unclear when this work referred to was undertaken and whether the technology that is available today to locate cables is was available at that time. Mm -hmm. it, it is also important to note that maintenance and repair works will be limited to specific areas and not um, involved. Can, you, can I just get you to repeat that, that last bit that we're having some experience at this end and we lost oh, okay. you for uh, about uh, 30 <laughs> seconds in fact. Okay, is that um, it, it was it's unclear. Yeah. Oh, yes, I can hear some distortion. <laughs> so on, it's the, uh... is it all good now? Can you hear me okay? I don't know where the problem is. Somebody noticed. Do it. Well, shall I plug this in the other side? I can't, I can't get it in. Let's send you the power of the No. Nope. Okay. Well, it's on the floor. I don't know. 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 I can, can you hear us, Ms. Brown? We're, we're trying a slightly different the route of the okay, sound. Can you hear us? Yeah, yeah, I can hear. Oh, it's the incoming. It's the incoming. It's the incoming. Um, <laughs> the incoming. Thank you. 
Sarah, can you hear us now? Yeah, yeah. Hello. Sarah? Yes. Can you hear me? Sarah, can you hear us on the speaker? Yes, yes, I can. Hello, hello. Hello. All right, Sarah, if you can hear, um, try taking us back to uh, where you were about five minutes ago and, uh, and join us back up. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Okay, so the where I talked about the rebuttal evidence... You had finished talking about the, uh, I think, the rule. I think you were beginning to talk about the policy. I wasn't quite sure. Oh, okay. Uh, it might be um, where I was specifically addressing um, the rebuttal. So the rebuttal evidence of council's archaeologist advised that, in their opinion, it is impossible for contractors to guarantee that excavations will be solely limited to the existing areas of cut and fill, where there are no surface markers to indicate the below ground extent of cut and fill. And evidence for this view was taken during the Christchurch residential rebuild program. So it is unclear to us when this work, this work referred to was undertaken and whether the technology that is available today to locate cables was available at that time. It also is important to note that maintenance and repair works will be limited to specific areas and not and involve a complete rebuild of the network. A rebuild would likely comprise a new build and therefore potentially out of scope for the activities well proposed in archaeological areas. So Well has a dedicated team of cable locators that identify the location of cables prior to works. There are also other technologies such as electric pulses that Well utilise to locate cables. Above ground infrastructure is subject to the same rules where this infrastructure is clearly identifiable for the purposes of maintenance and repair. Further, well, record our coordinates of our electricity infrastructure on a network register and include this data in our GIS systems. And given the nature of electricity, it's very important that the system aligns with what is in the ground. And for this reason, we have a good understanding where the infrastructure is, and we are confident that we can work within existing in-ground or on-ground dimensions and within existing areas of cut and fill. In the past, when we installed cables, the trench was typically one metres wide by 600 millimetres deep for low voltage and for high voltage, and cable jointing, the areas increase to enable sufficient space for field staff to get into a trench, lay a cable and complete jointing. So this confirms that the footprint disturbed during the laying process is considerable. In addition, it's highly likely that other services are located alongside the electricity cables, particularly in road reserve, which again may increase the area disturbed. Also, when the road itself was constructed, the land either side of the road would have been disturbed. As set out in Mr. Campbell's evidence, the types of excavation proposed by Well for works in existing trenches, footings or foundations are not new excavations within untouched sites. In his view, excavation in existing cuts will not damage archeological sites. Mr. Campbell's evidence 
illustrates this through an example test whereby the archaeological values of the site are expected to have been destroyed by road construction and existing utility infrastructure. And as such, it is unlikely the surviving values could be assessed as high or outstanding. So I will now hand you over to Mr. Campbell to summarize his evidence. If you're still there, Matt. <laughs> Yep. Oh. Yes. Now I'm on. Right. right, I haven't actually prepared a written summary, uh, sirs, but, uh, well, madam, sirs and madam. Well, we've, um, we've, uh, we've read your evidence, so we'll just uh, highlight the main points and any other comments that you want to make. I guess the main points were twofold. One, that the... Um, the assessment of these sites to include them in uh, scheduled in the district plan is not, in my opinion, particularly robust uh, methodology. In fact, it's anything but robust. I couldn't see, I couldn't in fact see how exactly Mr. Cable had assessed them. Um, so whether what the significance of the sites is, um, and whether they should be included in the plan or where they should sit in the plan, um, it's really quite unclear to me. I then um, looked at the most recent of the sites that I, I myself examined, which is um, one on River Road, uh, the big one on River Road, um, and I concluded that it's really not uh, in very good condition at all, that site, in fact, in rather poor condition. And so I questioned whether it should be um, scheduled. I note that Mr. Cable's... Uh, um, subsequent, subsequently had modified his own assessment of that. But um, <clears throat> on the basis of my own experience at that site, I concluded that it was in poor condition. Um, the, road, the road itself had effectively destroyed everything beneath the road, um, and that it would be, uh, in my own words, would not pass a test of reasonable cause to suspect that there would be archaeology there. Um, which is uh, words I've taken out of the Heritage New Zealand Bohiri Tauranga Act, um, and that um, having to uh, undergo an archaeological assessment each time uh, sort of maintenance works needed to be done would be sort of disproportionate. I think that summarises my evidence. Um, and did you have any comment to make on this issue as to whether or not um, excavating within the... Um, Assumed trench uh, or re excavations within the, res with the assumed trench was kind of likely to be able to be done in a way that wouldn't expose new surfaces. Yes, I think it can. I think it can be done. Our, I guess, our recent experience with um, well, it's 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 a bit of the opposite in some ways. Recent experience with uh, Corus putting in fibre optic, they locate quite accurately where the existing services are. So um, I don't see there'd be any point, any problem um, staying with them. <laughs> and uh, Ms. Brown might also make a comment on this. The issue wasn't so much whether they, whether you could locate the services with, with a high degree of confidence. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It was really whether in actual fact you were more likely than not that exposed soils that you hadn't previously excavated because you didn't know where the size of the the uh, previous trenches don't work. Yeah. Um, I, I don't see why um, well and other service providers can't um, excavate with care to uh, ensure that they don't, in fact, expose new soils. Um, and, and trenches are usually, uh, you know, existing trenches are usually quite wide. So um, they, they could uh, excavate something more narrowly. Are records kept of, of the trench widths? I mean, you've obviously, there's obviously detailed information about exactly where the surfaces are and being able to locate them, but um, wasn't clear on whether when the original works were done, whether you know, records were kept okay for this particular section of the line, we went 100 um, centimetres wide and X, centimetres of metres deep or, or whatever the, the metric is, do we have that sort of precision or is it based on generally at that time we used 
the sort of digger with the sort of size head and we generally excavated X. We, we have specific um, standards that we have to adhere to when we're laying cables. So there is a set of standards, particularly when people are working in the trench for health and safety purposes. So yes, yes, there is. So those standards, um, were they in place, I mean, did the standards change over time? Were they in place at the time that the you know, various cables were laid and the excavations were done? I guess just trying to get um, there. Yeah, that would be something I would work into, but um, my knowledge working in the electricity industry, I feel like our trenching and um, most of our operations are probably more streamlined, more more narrower, our cable um, trenches. Um, obviously yeah, we, sorry, what was that? Sorry, I just was meaning, are you meaning in the more recent context that the trenches are narrower than what they would have been earlier? Yeah, with the incorporation particularly of the... Um, the National Code of Practice for Utility Operators, we're really restricted in terms of what we can do, particularly in the transport corridor, and, and we have to get cars and things from council. So it's become a lot more restrictive. Ms. Brand, if, if I could continue some questions along that, that line, I have no doubt that. Um, well has very accurate uh, tools at, at, at the fingertips. Um, but as you've articulated, other utility uh, suppliers are also in the same location. Um, can you speak with the same confidence of their capability? Um, I guess I can't answer that for you for, for the other yeah. operators, but... Um, yeah, we we are specifically advocating for electricity, um, and I would hope that the other utility providers are doing the same thing. Um, yeah, so I know I can't comment on that. I guess a subsequent question, and maybe you can help me. I'm assuming you've got standard operating procedures where. In, in the maintenance work you've been doing of recent times, let's say in the last three or four years, if during that process, um, when you've been accessing existing trenches, have you had any appearances where archaeological items have been identified? Um, we, we did... Not, not necessarily. We did discover some bones once, but they ended up being pig bones. But we do have an archaeological policy at well, which everyone is required to adhere to if there is something discovered. Um, and that's closely, we train staff on it, and it's something that we work hard to make sure they are looking out for when they're doing work. My final question, um, I'm beginning to understand that utility operators often try to use the same trench. Yes. And so I want to explore, um, when you originally dig a trench, and I think you've said that you identify its diameters and you mark that, and it's a slightly larger space than you need to put the actual utilities in, and you need that larger space for your workers. Um, my question is, as more utility providers place their assets in the ground, is some of that extra space being taken up? And so my question then is, if you're going to retrospectively go back in, are you not going to have to dig a slightly wider trench? Again, we have specific standards around how close other utilities can be from our cables um, because they can make them not work appropriately. So um, over time, I guess new things have been placed, but then again, they're already there and we're only looking at doing maintenance and repair within that existing cut and fill area. 
I can make a comment on that. Uh, for instance, again, the chorus cables um, were done under an archaeological authority precisely because they were avoiding utilities already there and were cutting a new trench but, um, alongside the current trenches. So in that case, it is done under authority and it does go through the, the complete uh, resource consent authority process, but that's a new um, a new trench, which probably widens the overall amount of trenching that's been done. Yeah. You see what I mean? We completely um, would agree for new stuff, new builds, that we would go down that, that path. That's, that's no issue. Thank you. I missed your earlier comment about, about uh, trench widths. What, what sort of average width um, trench are you actually requiring these days? You made a distinction, I know, between sort of low, well, moderate voltage and high voltage cables. Yeah. So I, it really just depends on um, if we're just supplying a dwelling or it's more of a distribution cable. But don't have it off the top of my head because I got it from the guys at work, but I'll just find it in my writing. So for the low voltage, it's one meters, one meter wide by 600 millimeters deep. And then for high voltage and cable jointing, which is a joint in the cable where they have to do all this work to join it together, um, it's quite a bit bigger. But I don't, I think the width of the depth is closer to two meters. And the, the width is, um, I don't have that information on me right now, but I can find out. Is that each side of the, the cable or the full extent? So is it one metre each side of the cable? Is that what the width is, or one metre in total? Um, it's usually either side. Yeah. Two metres in total for that low voltage and then four metres or whatever it is in total for that high voltage. Yeah, yeah. So normally when we take our easements over properties, we get for an underground cable, we'll get a two metre width. And are the cables always laid in the centre of the trench or does it vary quite markedly? It will vary and it usually depends on ground conditions, like if there's other utilities in the ground, we have to be again certain distances from the other utilities and vice versa. So, um, and quite often we'll put the cable where developers put the trench for us. They would often dig trenches for us and we wouldn't put them in there. And when you want to go back in for a cable, do you, is it the same width? that you have to excavate, or can you excavate to a narrow width? No, it'd usually just be a pothole, what we call a pothole. So it's yeah. just like a square, um, and we can we can accurately find where the fault is. And no, we, we definitely don't need to excavate the whole trench. It would just be where the fault is. Well, that, 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 that would be true with a bit of maintenance and repair, but it wouldn't be for replacement which is the other part of your sort? Replacement would more relate to pillar boxes um, and distribution ring main units and transformers, which are essentially above ground. Um, and they are prone to faulting um, or needing maintenance. So that would be a replacement for us. But it's very, like I said in, the, in my summary, they're very easy to understand the extent, how deep the foundation is, um, yeah. So you still need to excavate, obviously not to the same extent, but you still need to excavate for replacement cabinets as well? Yes, yeah. Mm. Yes, thank you, Derek Sargent. Um, three questions. Um, which either of you could, could pitch in on. Um, firstly, given that we're working with um, registered archaeological site areas, do you not have to get an authority for that work as well? Only if the 
I'll get the wording correct. If you have reasonable cause to suspect that the work you will be doing will damage or destroy the site. Um, so, yeah, I think that summarizes, yeah. So um, if, if the work is not going to damage or destroy the site, then you don't need an archaeological authority. <clears throat> So you're saying, in effect, Dr. Campbell, that if you're going into the same hole, then uh, you've got reasonable grounds for saying that you don't expect to, to uh, intercept any uh, archaeological evidence. That, that is correct. We always advocate for avoidance of, of uh, the archaeological features in the first instance. It's fine. That's, that's quite a different sort of expectation than what um, Mr. Cable advised us of, because I would have to say that his expectation was that it was highly likely that you would be disturbing new ground or finding um, archaeological things. I, so, I, 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 so, it's pretty, so I was going to say, so it's fairly common for you to to, to give that advice, I suppose, to, to well to say that you wouldn't, or you give that advice to HNZPT to say, this is what we're doing. We don't expect to find anything, or you don't contact, you don't contact them at all. Uh, not if we, not if we, cons not if we uh, come to the conclusion that there's no reasonable cause to suspect uh, any damage to the site. So, um, uh, of course, they don't, they don't want to uh, to right. have to deal with every piece of work that's going on either. So, um, so yes, we would, we would, of course, rely on wells uh, and other utility providers um, having a nice tight methodology which they're going to follow. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And uh, they, would, they would do their work under some sort of accidental discovery protocol. Uh, we would always always advise that. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, Dr. Campbell, you just in terms of like the um, Ms. Brown, in terms of like the objectives and policies and some of the things we have to consider, um, Game Change Night has to give effect to Tertiary Whaimana about the protection of sites and has to take into account various area management plans, which strongly suggests that we take a precautionary approach to these activities. Do, do you think that the rule, the policy and the rule that you've suggested respond appropriately to those um, high level um, imperatives, if you like? I think because we are only repairing, replacing maintenance in existing areas of cut and fill and based on Matthew's evidence that we're not actually disturbing or the it's already been disturbed the soil and it's most likely not the value that it once was. Um, any anything new, we consider that we should go through the rule the resource consent process. We agree with that. But we feel that the the ground has already lost its value based on the evidence that Matthew submitted and the fact that we will be working within those existing cut and fill areas. Right. Um, okay. Uh, the third question I have is looking at the rule you suggested. I guess the second, the second part of it, which reads, all work shall be undertaken within the existing in-ground or on-ground dimensions of the infrastructure and any existing areas of cut and fill. Um, that's, that's sort of in the way of a formal standard in relation to what you suggest as a permanent activity. Can you think of anything else that you might like to add to that as a performance standard? For one thing, you mentioned um, the fact that you operate pursuant to 
your own in-house protocols. I don't know whether other network companies have in-house protocols for the same sorts of thing. Um, the other thing is that you um, obviously take advice um, from um, Dr. Campbell, Mr. Campbell, Dr. Campbell, sorry, Dr. Campbell, um, on this. I just wonder whether, in the course of doing that, what another sort of belts and braces type thing might be that you actually do get a statement from a suitably qualified person that says that it's highly unlikely that you're going to be. Um, Disturbing archaeological things. I'm just, I'm just trying to, I'm suggesting to you that there might be some beefing up in what's being proposed. Yeah. And that's, I mean, it was, it was a suggestion, suggested rule, just because it's gone through and been tested um, through the Taronga operative plan. Um, so I just felt it might give council a bit more confidence around that. But it's definitely something that we can look at amending and changing. Um, and we can certainly look at that after this with our um, legal team and make some improvements or suggestions. Right. Well, actually, just on that, I mean, obviously, you operate clearly with some... Um, Hamilton, Waikato and Waipa and Tauranga, I guess Western Bay is well. I'm not sure what your area is. Um, they might all have um, some of those other ones might have some rules. Are you aware of any other permitted activity rules that operate elsewhere in the country for network utility companies of this nature? Um, I just haven't come across an example where there are archaeological sites in road reserve. So that's, I think I managed to find the Tauranga example, but I haven't come across any others. Right. But not saying that there isn't any, but it's just I haven't come across any others. Okay. I think I noticed the still a unitary plan has a laser permitted activity maintenance and repair. Oh, okay. Um, that's I don't know why attached to that by way of performance standards, but um, I suggest you might want to look around. Yeah. All right, thank you, uh, Ms. Brown, Dr. Campbell. Thank you for your, uh, your evidence today. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I just check something. <clears throat> the new rule that's proposed is, is SACS 1933F. Now, is this, is this really a new rule or is it a modification of the existing rule 1933? 1933F is part of the same rate to work on site in Chevrolet 6A. I'm assuming it's a new rule, not a modification of that. I don't know if I actually need to see the screen. Yeah, I think it's, I think it was before this was so we've got double, we've got some sort of double rules. Yeah. It's an addition to the new rule. It's an addition to the new F. Yeah. Okay, it's not in the new. Yeah. No. That's fine. 19. Yes, 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 Stanley, can you hear us? Uh, yes, I can hear you. Thank you. 
Um, if you can hear us, we're just having a few sound issues, so just bear with us whilst we sort that out. Maybe we... Oh, now, now you're through. Uh, kia ora koutou. Can you hear me now? Yes, that's fine. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, right, well, we've read your, we've read your, uh, uh, your brief, so um, just highlight and talk us through it. Thank you, sir. Uh, I would just um, like to thank Mr. Rice. So there's been some um, audio issues, and I tried to listen in a little bit this morning, but um, couldn't hear it. So he helpfully forwarded me the recording. Um, but so I'd just like to start. I haven't been able to listen to it all, but um, in terms of Hamilton City presentation this morning, uh, I'd just like to make some comments in response uh, to the scope issue raised by Mr Muldowney. Uh, as you'll see from my brief of evidence, Quarterline Holdings has made a submission uh, opposing the approach taken in the plan change and in my evidence. I've noted some discrepancies between the schedule and the mapping. Um, what I heard, I haven't been able to listen to it all, but from what I heard, Mr Muldowney was um, describing the legal descriptions as a minor um, change. And in my opinion, this is a fundamental change to the application. It's a different management approach and a different piece of land. And the mapping and the schedules work hand in hand for how the rules will be administered. The schedule is notified, um, if you'll see my, um, on my evidence, figure four, the legal description in the schedule is, is a discrete piece of land. Um, and then if you turn also to my figure three, this is taken from NZAA's ARC site. Um, again, it's several discrete pieces of land where borrow pits have been identified from photography. Um, and I'd just like to reiterate the points made in my evidence that at the Plan Change 5 hearings, Dr Gumley advised that the sites hadn't been really checked. And um, so we're in the position now where none of the evidence has responded to the submission or um, my evidence because it said that it's out of scope. However, uh, I am not able to find any investigations or review or basis that's moved on since Plan Change 5 to justify the extent mapped. And also there's a, a, a doesn't align with what's in the schedule. So Plan Change 5, in my opinion, was appropriate because it was operating as an alert layer and that was the method proposed. But now that we're dealing with um, a different set of provisions and as you discussed this morning, a different management regime, it needs greater specificity and uh, evidence base for what why the area is so broad. Uh, and I've been unable to find that. And therefore it's my opinion that that it's not an appropriate resource management response. Um, as I've also pointed out in my evidence I consider it a duplication with the authority process under the Heritage New Zealand Puhere Taonga Act. Uh, I've some experience in this, acting for um, Auckland Transport on resource consents and designations um, and obtaining archaeological authorities for those projects and also for private landowners undertaking subdivision. And, and in my view, it's a, it is a duplication and unnecessary. Um, I support the approach of uh, showing these as an alert layer uh, that and I think that that gives effect to the Waikato region, Regional Policy Statement. Um, and I've highlighted that in my evidence, um, that provision, that method uh, that is um, directing that alert layers as an appropriate response. So those are my key points. Uh, the 
the evidence base for the mapping if it is to function as a role in a different management regime and and secondly the duplication with the authority process so I'd be happy to answer any questions Right. <clears throat> yes, thank you. So in a nutshell, what is it that you're actually seeking? I'm seeking uh, that the category two, group two sites uh, retain a alert layer management approach. Right. And I don't, I, I agree that the group one sites that are of significance and have um, considerable investigation warrant the approach taken, but I, I do not agree that the same applies to the Group Two sites. Yeah, right. <clears throat> so that would and an alert layer on that matter would satisfy Cordeline. That's correct, and, and that was the basis that Cordeline supported Plan Change Five. Um, and I, I there is a, a a real difference between mapping um, a point, a site, or, or a bigger area. And I just note that Fatu Kororo Drive um, cuts through um, much of this area, A127, that also covers the borderline land. And uh, as the commissioners may be aware from site visits, this is um, construction is well underway. Um, and uh, 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 the mapping is, uh, uh, unusual that it follows the boundary of the designation in some parts and then in other parts it doesn't and, and I, I don't understand or um, cannot find any evidence for for how the boundaries of, of these areas have been defined and they seem to go way beyond what was an ARC site um, which is that information I've presented in my figure three. All right. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Green. That's, uh, that's clear, so thank you for, uh, for your evidence. Thank you. Sure. Sure. The uh, long question of the I'll go for my next. I'll try to make it a second. It's a completely rhetorical question, and you know the answer. Okay, well, much of what I was going to say has been actually been covered this morning in the detail and the influence from Mr. Mulvaney. Um, in terms of the plan change summary, um, all, I, all I really reiterate there is that, uh, that the plan change had a very limited scope. It was never intended to be a comprehensive review of all archaeological and cultural sites, but rather to ensure better alignment between the sites and the uh, New Zealand Archaeological Association database and the ODP schedules. And just on, sorry, on, on that point, we've already heard quite a lot of evidence on submitters yeah. saying clearly these amendments to the maps at that point are quite accurate. I mean, wasn't like you've just simply taken the information from the um, site 
and put it in the OPP. Some of it's been remapped. Come to the remapping in the due course. So what I was going to go on to is to talk about the work streams that were undertaken in response to these issues, those that submitted. But the long and the short of it, uh, in terms of plan change nine, is that it resulted in over 50, 50 plus, 56, 57 additional recorded sites being added to schedules A, B, and C of the ADP. And some of those sites were transferred from schedule B to schedule C and vice versa. And most importantly, the status of group two sites from schedule C and the PC9 has changed from information only to control activity for specified works and particularly work works. And um, I won't say uh, section six, six and seven of my statement talk about the submission themes. I, if you'll leave, I'll take that as read. It's covered in the 42A report. Uh, all I would say is that there's certainly the submission themes are not a concise science. Um, and a lot of the notification process flushed out a number of submission themes and most of them were to be expected given the nature of the plan change. And, and what struck me is probably that the most recurring thing that came out of that uh, were the number of submitters who were looking for deletions from the schedules mm -hmm. for a variety of reasons, either because the mapping was perceived to be inaccurate or it was perceived to be an error, or typically because uh, the site had undergone a degree of development and uh, therefore was perceived to have lost its, its archaeological and cultural values. That's all I'm going to say about the, the, the submission themes. Now, what I was going to go on to talk about was really just a, a summary of the post notification investigations of the additional work streams that have occurred in response to those submission themes or submission issues. And then I was going to touch on the key changes as a result of those investigations, and then the key changes as a result of ongoing consultation between myself, uh, Council, Mr. Cable, and a small number of submissions. So, in particular, a Heritage New Zealand submission gave rise to three post notification work streams. The first concerns um, Heritage New Zealand submission questioned whether adequate, adequate ground truthing had been carried out before updating the appendix A schedules with the additional arc side entries. And whilst Heritage New Zealand supported the principle of expanding the appendix A schedules, it raised questions about the condition of some of the sites, noting that not all sites were able to be visited is part of the PC9 investigation stage. And Heritage New Zealand also noted that some sites have clearly been affected by more recent development, which is a common theme with a number of other submitters. Heritage New Zealand contended that if sites no longer contained archaeological value, then council should reconsider whether they should be scheduled and whether landowners should be subject to a resource consent process. Therefore, a key post notification work stream was the site review undertaken by Mr. Cable. And this was referred to in the to Way report as a ground truthing process. So, that review, as we've already heard this morning, that review extended to all recorded archaeological sites not previously visited as part of the archaeology site inventory. And up until that point, and partly due to time constraints, the pre notification site visits. Had largely been limited to council owned land. Now, in saying that, the review of some sites, such as those that were already in the ODP or culturally significant sites or fine spots, were omitted from that review process. Second sort of key work stream was a, a review of the significance rankings. A number of submitters questioned the archaeological significance of sites, either because this was perceived to have been diminished by on-site development, or it was questioned whether the sites had been attributed to the correct schedule. So another key work stream was Mr. Cable's post-notification review of the significance rankings. And that made sense, considering the outcomes of the ground truthing and any new archaeological reporting that had been completed since September 2021. And that does Significant because that's the date that the inventory, the archaeological background of inventory was handed over to Hamilton City Council. Moving on to the third work stream, which is to do with mapping, which is an issue that, as we say, has cropped up this morning several times. Some submitters, including Hamilton City Council, questioned the accuracy of the site extents as shown on the planning maps. 
And that led to the third key work stream being a review of the planning maps of Ben by Mr. Cable. This review assessed whether the map extents accurately reflected the site extents provided in the archaeological inventory and the findings of the site review. There are recommended changes to the schedules as a result of the mapping review. Some sites are no longer affected by Plan Change 9, having been confirmed as a mapping error. Other sites are proposed to ensure other, other changes are proposed to ensure that legal descriptions are accurate and that properties are not wrongly affected by the plan. Now, this was written, of course, prior to this morning's discussion may happen. And I accept that um, it is absolutely critical that the descriptions in the maps correspond and um, the maps are wrong, the rules are to some extent meaningless. So um, you've already picked out at least one error so far, and I agree with customer value the folks that are in the as a way to, to clarify that issue. Uh, I support that entirely. In terms of, they're the three key work streams, but in terms of the outcomes from that um, and the recommendations as a result of those investigations, well, the biggest change is really in Appendix A in the schedules. Group 1 sites are largely unchanged in the modified version of Plan Change Time, except for two sites which have been added. And one of those was admitted an error in the modified Plan Change and has been put back into the Group 1. And the other change to Schedule 8B concerned the upgrading of the site from group two to group one. But the more significant recommendation concerns group two sites in schedule eight C, which council is now proposing to split into two schedules, being group eight C, which is group two, and eight C A, which would be group three. Propose that the group three sites be listed for information purposes only, as we've already heard. And in effect, that replicates the status quo with respect to the old piece existing treatment of group two sites. Now, the recommended split of group two to create group three resolves a number of submitted concerns regarding sites which have been heavily modified and perhaps ought not to be the subject of a resource consent process. 42A report supports the recommended changes to group 8C and the creation of Schedule 8CA. And on the face of it, the recommended split of Schedule 8C does not disadvantage any submitters since the notified provisions required a consent process from Group 1 and Group 2 sites anyway. However, due to the proposed new schedule, consequential changes are recommended to the plan. And that includes, for example, the addition of significant rankings and archaeological site assessment criteria within section 8.2 of the plan. I've seen Mr. Ryan's recommendation with regards to those changes and I agree with the outline, the wording outlined in his, his evidence. I think it adds clarity and transparency. Other changes include the addition of definitions to clarify the difference between group one, two, and three sites. And I know that panel's concerns or query we got this morning regarding the wording of PSA. Uh, I take I take the point that a lot of uh, Māori heritage is handed down from verbally, from uh, person to person, and uh, in principle, I certainly wouldn't be opposed to a rewording or um, alternative wording or wording to accompany what is already proposed in Mr. Pegg's and Mr. Ryan's evidence. And with respect to the definitions, I agree with Mr. Ryan's suggestion that the definition of headings should more appropriately refer to archaeological or cultural sites rather than archaeological and cultural sites, as was initially proposed in Mr. Ryan's primary evidence. And the concern there isn't it, isn't it the case that some will be both? Some will be both. Yeah. Uh, but some may just be one and not both. Yeah. And I think that was the concern was yeah. that yeah. Uh, there may be a situation mm -hmm. where an applicant contends that he's not both, mm -hmm. she's not both. And therefore, the rules that mm. follow are going to be part of them. <clears throat> and they're not treated differently in any way. A little bit of energy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in, terms of, in terms of policy recommendations, which are followed on from the, these investigations, uh, I'll just draw your attention to policy 1926F, which concerns the recognition and recording of lost, of lost features. 
that's really the only sort of policy area where the 42A report reached a different conclusion to the notified intent of PC9, and it resulted in a different recommendation compared to Mr. Ryan's primary evidence. The explanation for this policy referred to the desirability of recording and recognizing lost features, whereas the notified policy made this an imperative. And given the lack of specific guidance as to how that policy might be implemented, the 42A report recommended that this remain a desirable outcome rather than a requirement. Amendments have subsequently been recommended by Council, which address my concerns and which now provide a range of options for recording or recognising lost features, and I, and I support those recommended changes. Uh, we've talked a lot about uh, Well Networks this morning. Uh, well Networks also sought the addition of uh, proposed policy 1926H to enable the consideration of above-ground articulation where the avoidance of adverse effects was not practicable. In my opinion, as I, as I stated in the report, the adverse effects associated with above-ground facilities have not been anticipated and tested as part of the Section 32 analysis. Manifenua have not had opportunity to consider the effects associated with that. And for that reason, I didn't support policy, proposed policy 19268. Thinking about that just a little bit further, the potential for above-ground development would also um, contradict some of the outcomes that a number of Manifenua groups were also aiming for in terms of trying to maintain open aspects with some uh, sites of cultural significance. So if you have above ground utilities, it was a flying face of Manifenua groups of biology to some extent. And I also note that no other utilities uh, made submissions on this issue uh, mm -hmm. in the way that well networks did. So how much of an issue it is, I'm not entirely. Sure. Just just don't let um, other people's um, views to speak somewhere, probably from this ground that Heritage New Zealand supported their submission, didn't they? The one network submission? Yes. I would need to, I need to come back to them just to check. I don't know. No, I think so. Um, Sorry, just in case they're dead and they're just going to be a little bit of 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 a little bit there weren't that many, well, there were very few areas where I, I took a different uh, stance from, from the council. Um, but I draw your attention to rule 1933D in particular, and that identified that earthworks and scheduled uh, HC sites would be a control activity. The 42A report supports a hierarchy of consent status for earthworks, depending upon the level of archaeological significance. In my opinion, given that PC9 differentiated between the levels of significance between Group 1 and Group 2 sites, I felt that should be reflected in the activity status of certain activities, thereby contributing towards a balance between enabling growth whilst protecting Hamilton's North heritage. And the preamble for Plan Change 9 on the council website talks about this before it gets into any of the documentation, mm -hmm. any of the documentation the need for that balance. But in, so, just to be clear, are you going on to qualify that? Yeah, yeah, yeah just to okay. Okay. On to on. Yeah. Paragraph 21. In the interim, since the 42A report, additional consideration has been given to the White Devil Tony's request that earthworks and group one and two sites should both be classified as a restricted discretionary activity. This is in response to historical information regarding. Mati Wairiri in the Waikato region of theatre development, as described by Mr. Ryan in his statement of evidence, supplemental evidence, and as discussed this morning. And specifically, Mr. Ryan raised concerns regarding the potential for earthworks from the water park being a controlled activity, which was arguably problematic, not to mention inappropriate, given the sensitivities historically associated with burial grounds. So Mr. Ryan proposed an amendment to Rule 1932D, whereby earthworks on Group 2 water sites 
would become a restricted discretionary activity with the balance of the group two sites retaining control of activity status for eight works. Well, I agree that historically there are sensitivities associated with burial grounds. And having regard to the relief sought by White Hat Tony, I think an amendment to Rule 923 d could be justified in the circumstances. How realistic? I mean, I, 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 this is going on this morning. I'm trying to think, you know, what's been the earthwork? I don't know, obviously, greater than it will go on from the other part. Is it common? Well, I think. I mean, just the, the, the example was given. Sorry. Yeah. The, the example this morning was given. It's given this um, the um, regional theatre site. Yeah. Which was. Um, but that, that wasn't just a demo yeah. No, no. Well, no, it was a demo file. Yeah. It, it, it was. It wasn't. It may not have been listed, but it was clearly mm -hmm. demo by you. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the use of demo file here is is actually quite a broad concept. We're not talking about an institution for the past. Not the sphere of the I don't believe so. Okay. So that, that wasn't clear. Yeah. Because yeah. I mean, one would assume earthworks in the river park, apart from it's used to be familiar. Yeah. I mean, not, not even if it's not an idea. Yeah, I think that was one of the, uh, I was involved in the litigation associated with the resolving the. Inter interface between the Udapa and the proposed um, foundations that would have been established for the oh, theatre. The the and it was, um, yeah, it was very clear that you would not ordinarily find yourself in a situation mm -hmm. where dealing with a proposal to 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 have that foundation as an earthworks anywhere near the term. It's mm -hmm. very, very rare. Yeah, and so if, if we take it a bit further, <clears throat> with our little part, it's not a defined little part, but there is a recovery of the line. But you're not going to fight that as well, say. I'm just wondering what the, what the reality is, yeah. what we're talking about here. I don't, I mean, I don't, I don't see it as an elevated solution by, by any means. Mm -hmm. my, my, certainly, my initial preference would have been to treat, um, treat category two as a control activity. Mm -hmm. But in light of the additional information that was that was yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, no, I see where you're coming from, trying to kind of sense of that. I'm just thinking of you know, just the reality of it, actually. Well, I mean, really, really, you know, we should be seeking and, and indeed Mr. Ryan opened the door for a number of money panel groups to give information of or get some clarity yeah. on that issue really. Yeah. And um, it would be good to have some further input from no, no, no. no, and I just, I mean, that's one of the complexities raised by having that separated plan change process where we're not having that information feed into this particular process here. And you can surprise that um, the scheduled food pass site could be in lots of examples of where our body had been found outside the boundaries, you know, in close proximity. And so, um, yeah, the, the footprint of the actual scheduled site doesn't necessarily. Actually, I think that's what we were doing. Well, I think some of the submissions and, and things that um, we get that information before us, and I think that the issue of public pollution where we will need to be in the meantime, yeah. controlled activity status, pollutionary now, given that we can't. I think that, that was the concern, yes, that we can't turn it down. And we're making a, an assumption here that other part are more sensitive than other, probably significant sites. And whether we're best placed to make that assumption is another. Is another you would have heard my question this morning to Mr. Ryan about whether we should, as a precautionary approach, um, include other cultural sites, but at the moment we don't take the information about how significant a particular car was, how significant a particular area was, um, whether there's, irrespective of whether there's likely to be any um, material type of problem. Yeah, is there um, a little disagree more about uh, the Eponymous ancestor of a particular haku or ivy that was born there, for example, which might give it a real you know, significant sensitive thing, and we just don't have that information. And so, I guess thinking about that from a cautionary point of view, should we be looking at until this new plan change comes through, taking a um, approach whereby we look at a, a higher level activity state? 
Yes, yes, I, I heard you heard you ask that this morning. And my my personal my personal view, my personal view as well is that um, I really favoured the the controlled activity status for group two sites. Uh, and um, my view is that the, the plan plan is about balance to some extent. Um, council up front about that, they need to balance because of interests. And um, and I really saw the distinguishing distinguishing between group one and group two sites uh, as, as being um, logical. It follows the format, a number of other plans throughout the country. And if I were a landowner and and uh, my lens showed that uh, I have a group two site in my property, but my neighbor had a group one site. I would anticipate that they're going to correspond in her up or the common her up or room status or roles in terms of what I could and couldn't do. And, and to my mind, if, if we were to err on the site of course and completely and say that group one and group two sites are both going to be reflected with their view, and um, my view is that the campaign is, is not in term one. But it's definitely being weakened, I think, in terms of achieving that sort of practical balance and mm -hmm. permitting the protection of average. I guess the other way of thinking about that is, is if, if, it, if it merits an RD, then why wouldn't you elevate those to the. And to keep the pipeline clean and mm -hmm. clear. Cool. And, and I don't want to say it further by recognizing a full three. Status as well, yeah. there's no control. Yeah. So, if you compare what we started with under the, the ODP as a standard just now, I heard that that piece of the post, even with control, the ability status, still, still giving a lot more than the plan was able to achieve at the moment. So, I don't I don't feel it's a backward step. It's not without risk, you know, but all, all plan changes have risk, and all plan changes are struggle to, to satisfy all parties. So, I'm not going to be. That plan to some degree, no matter what course you go. But um, I'd certainly favor the control activity status, and uh, the solution that I've supported here is a compromise between. Mm -hmm. uh, well, to follow on question if it remains in group two, or if they remain in group two, mm -hmm. does the, do the uh, measure of discretion in the RDS properly address that issue? You might just want to check that. Are relevant matters of discretion mm -hmm. that they were then at. Group two were elevated to RDS? No, no, no. It's a group of staying in the RDS. The other bus stay in group two of oh. RDS, but make it that matters of discretion are appropriate okay. for that category. I think it's kind of, I think, I think I need to check with Mr. Ryan, but I think the, 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 the matters are much the same for. <clears> so why would not you put them in one? That's why that's what I'm asking. They can be moved later on once once it's returned. Yeah, yeah. I'm certainly anticipating that there would be a, a vast number of changes if the, the second work stream comes online next year or one other day with strikes of what sort of events. Um, it has certainly been difficult um, dealing with uh, objectives, policies, and rules that are intended to cover archaeology and sites of cultural significance. Yeah. The, only, the scope of the plan change is so narrow that it's really just focusing on the ability. And, um, yeah. and that must be hard for non panel groups to 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 what's over the horizon you know, with, with the total on work stream and how relevant are these rules in the meantime. Mm -hmm. So it's there's an element of risk of the plan changing the limited scope that we have at the moment. And the last sort of thing. Um, in terms of the rules, the only other rule I was going to refer you to, which we've covered to some extent already, was the one network's request that uh, for an additional rule, 93 for the F to enable the maintenance and repair of existing utilities as a permitted activity. And I'd have to say initially, uh, when, I, when I first looked at that submission, I had uh, a degree of support for Wells' position, and it seemed like a bit of a no-brainer to me. But um, you asked earlier, this morning about had to outside the council and myself looked at um, what was available in other plans. And um, I made some uh, inquiries with regards to the Auckland Unitary Plan, the Power on the City Plan, the Western Bay County District Plan, Thames Current Angle Plan, and the Wellington City Plan, just to see what was available or how they 
treating utility maintenance in their plants. And um, what I found was that um, maintenance of utilities underground uh, under the Auckland Unitary Plan was a restricted discretionary activity. In Wellington, it was a control activity. And the total on the city plan, which as well have referred to several times, uh, I find is a bit of a grey area, to be honest. They have a they have a heritage component, there's a back and utility chapter which is separate. Um, the heritage component refers to minor structures and activities of a permitted activity. And then it's got a definition of minor structures and activities. And that does not include anything remotely like utility maintenance, in gardening and fence posts and you know, quite minor, minor, minor stuff. So I, uh, that's not to say that I've correctly interpreted the utilities chapter, but it seemed to me there was a, a, a potential sort of conflict there, and it wasn't crystal clear as to whether the works were connected. So I've got a sort of a question mark over that one. Uh, the Western Bay of Plenty District Plan, they did have some committed thresholds that appeared to be the area and volume thresholds. And um, yeah, so I, I looked at that, but at the end of the day, I've been guided by Mr. Cable. We've, we've had a discussions about this, and he's been able to show me examples, countries that have been uncovered, and um, comparison with where the French was supposed to be, or the utility was supposed to be, as opposed to where the French is, and so on. And I accept that he, he's got more experience in that field, obviously, than me. And um, you know, in the end, I've sided with um, Council and Mr. Cable on that as well. Um, then, we, we, we are now focusing, considering now to include with Wells utility, or did you, you know, did you let your mind also go also to other utilities? Well, I, I couldn't help but notice that um, Wells was the only utility submitter mm -hmm. as such, and I, and I would have thought if it were, if it was such an offensive provision that uh, any number of utility providers would have put forward. Mm -hmm. And uh, the fact that they're the only one. And it seems to me that it's not a big or die issue. Um, Can I ask you a question on that point? Um, are you or have you made inquiries to verify whether or not um, the frequency of the need and multiple other utilities use the same trench? So have you made an inquiry? Yeah, I think no is at all to the community that has been done at that time. Yeah. Uh, the last the last point I've just brought your attention to is that uh, Mr. Ryan's primary evidence included a proposed amendment to policy 25102E and 25.10.5.1, which was to do with the recognition of Schedule 8C sites in the context of signage. Mm -hmm. uh, the proposed changes weren't referenced in the 42A report and the change to the rule was not notified, but the changes are nonetheless supported because they recognize that incentive applications now associated with Group 2 sites. And they contribute towards consistent administration of the plan. That was really all uh, I had to say in terms of the issues, as I saw. Thanks, Carla. Um, and you don't have any issue with that being a consequential change? No. I didn't pick up on that. I can see the record that page four of the approval submission, I did support it. I then. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm going to say good night. <laughs> um, yeah, so it concludes the summer topic of that. So, um, no, uh, the only thing I was just going to um, really close out on was just that point this morning about. Um, the mapping and then scope, scope point. So that, that inventory, we will, we're doing it, we'll, we'll have that information for you during the course of Monday or Tuesday day, so I'll raise it in, in, in the moment. Um, and just so that we're clear on, on what we're doing, we are um, going to look at the extent of any changed map, mapping um, between the notification and what is now being recommended. So that's the difference between, I think it's the red and the yellow on this table of maps. 
And what we'll do is we'll look for those differences and we'll identify where those differences impact in the new certificate of title. Yeah. Um, and we'll we'll capture those certificates and, and get some information about. Um, and then we'll, we'll, I hope, need to have another discussion about what to do with that. Um, and on that point, I mean, I do want to just um, reinforce some of the, the submissions that were made this morning on this point about scope. Mm -hmm. I've gone back to the section 32 and some of the original um, uh, plan change documents, and it's very clear in the 32 that it talks about plan change with the purpose of um, identifying and, and mapping the extent of an archaeological site. And so this, this question of extent, the map extent of the site is a subject of plan change. And I maintain my submission that I made this morning that um, yeah, I think there's a distinction to be made between this plan change and the inherent extent concept, which is inherent in the plan change, and some of those other legal um, authorities, you know, like, for example, motor machinists, and let's put the best example where motor machinists was a case where it was a plan change area, which was defined. It, it had a map area of the plan change. That was the plan change. And then um, some parties wanted that map area of the plan change to extend to another block in the street. And so the question was, Okay, is that on the plan change and that, that question of map extent of the plan change? Now, we're not dealing with that situation here. In, in this situation, we're dealing with, with a plan change which inherent within the notified plan change was a live question of we're going to identify sites and we're going to try and figure out what's the map extent of them. Now, my solution to you is that, that that being the articulated purpose of the plan change, um, on public notification, the public is on notice. <laughs> All right, what I see in the notified version as the proposed map extent may stay that way or it may change depending upon the way the cards fall and how the evidence plays out in this plan change. So um, if I'm living right next door to the current proposed map, I am interested to see how that plays out and to ensure, for example, that if I'm opposed to the, 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 the arc site extending onto my property, that I would want to be a submitter and, and participate. So I say that opportunity is available to everyone, including these new certificates of title, um, and that you know, it, it would stand up to a, a clear order of mobile machines type legal analysis in terms now, having said that, 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 that might be the legal position, but you might take comfort in, in the city saying, well, all right, strictly speaking, we're entitled as a matter of law to say, no, sorry, neighbouring property, you were on full notice when the, the plan change was notified. And if you've um, not participated um, and now find yourself mapped too bad, um, if that is not a, a comfortable position for you to be in as a panel, not standing with the legal position, we can produce the inventory. And if, if, if your signal is that you would prefer to see some kind of additional communication go out to those titles, we can pick that up and we could do that to give you the added comfort that, that to the extent that someone might have taken by surprise, we're going to do a letter drop or whatever and give them an opportunity to say something about this. We need to modulate some who can do that, um, if that would be your preference. But I don't resolve from the legal position, which says that I think you're, you're safe if you were to say, no, you're on notice if you haven't participated. So, having, so we, we'll do the inventory and maybe we pick this up next week. <laughs> Just, just thinking about that, I mean, there's one other bit of information I think I would find quite useful in making that call, and that is the linear extent of these. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if it's five, ten meters across the boundary, we're probably not use it. A good meters or three hundred meters. As well, for a good They're, they're all. So my, my answer is they're all a little bit different. I mean, I, I'm scanning some of the maps just in the interim period. And, and you know, for example, there's there's a couple of map, map arc sites which are in um, 
highly urbanized areas like residential subdivisions. And the original uh, notified map extent captures a range of residential properties. The new map extent has reduced to a certain extent, and, and you know, half a dozen residential properties that were mapped are no longer mapped, and another half dozen now are. So they're all a bit different. There are some that are quite dramatic like that, which might involve another half dozen residential properties. And then, as you say, there are others that's just this kind of relatively minor encroachment down the edge of the boundary or something. So they're all a little bit different. Um, and I, we can... We can right, let's see what we've got first. Yeah, yeah. let's we'll, we'll, So we'll do that work for you next week, and then you can make a call. As I say, if, if the answer is, or well, the preference would be to handle some kind of a letter drop. But, but I think the, sorry, I was just going to say, I think the issue here is that I, do, I don't, I do, I certainly don't support an outcome where you say, we don't think the new mapping is in scope. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we think that you should, despite what you know, <laughs> we think you should be confined to map it according to your notified plan change. Because then you'll just end up with this mismatch where there's going to be a mm -hmm. map in the district plan which is different to what the ARC sites map yeah. show. And I don't think that's a great environmental outcome. You look for the alignment that was inherent in the DNA of this plan change that we were looking for that alignment. So I'd prefer to find a way for it. The, the word. Yeah. Sorry. No, no, no. An observation that I'm making from the evidence today is, was the fact that um, the arch site uh, map um, has, has been extended as part of that process. So I, I, I'm still having some discomfort about that. But, but my primary question was, um, I hear your argument or what you've submitted. Um, but am I correct in saying um, that those that were affected by uh, the notification of plan change nine would have received a letter saying this was going to occur? So it wasn't just a public notice, they received a letter. Uh, again, let me, let me just come back and check exactly what the extent of that direct notification process was. I'll, I'll, I'll address you on that next week because that would be very helpful. Can you come back to that inventory if you're able to just catch the relevant maps to the inventory so that we don't have to go back to the evidence? Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Is there any difference? Right? Your mind, not the plus about it, so it goes to the city. No. Is there any difference in your mind between the difference in the mapping that was made by way of submission as opposed to the way it happened, which is by way of evidence? No, I don't believe that there is. I mean, Firstly, all, all of them, your mapping decisions need to be evidential based on evidence, not on what someone says in the submission. So ultimately, it's the evidence that will, will inform you on what should be the correct mapping. The question of where that comes from, um, I, I would go back to my original submission, which is to say that I think it comes from the way that the, 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 the plan change was originally notified, which I say included inherent within it an idea that there was going to be identification of sites and resolution of mapped extents of those sites. So I think we have the scope that, that, that it's, it sits there because of the way that the plan change was formulated. And it didn't need a submission to create the scope for a map change, a map extent change. Last item, I guess, is, is just to, just to record. We did we did try to bring uh, um, the SNA and the NPSIB forward. Yes, I understand. Um, the that the department was otherwise engaged in the so, so. Well, is that the, um, the, the, to the extent that the city can assist in terms of 
efficiency, mm -hmm. just let us know what if you need to shift it around, we'll make sure that it's easy to speak about this weekend. Yeah. Right. Do you have anything else? All right. Right. We can turn until Monday morning, 9 o'clock, then. Thank you, everybody.